Hey, what's good? What's good? What's good? Welcome to Reflections of a DJ, the road podcast presented by DJ City and Beat Source. I'm one of your hosts, DJ Crooked. I got DJ Never here. Yo, yo, what's up? I got Jamie the Great here. Yeah, what up, what up? Uh, DJ D Miles is MIA. He's getting his ass fixed once again. Once again. But we got what a special guest here. I've known this dude for a long time. I would say over 15 years, close to 20 years uh, from the New York scene. He introduced me to the word John. You've seen him at the Do Over, the Rub, everything. One of the co founders of the Rub. Big shout to my man, Philly's best. All right. Cosmo Baker. What up, Cosmo what up, Baker? What up, what up, what up, what up? How you doing, fam? Great, man. Great. Good to be here, man. And good to see you. Uh, good to see you all of you guys as well. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For I sure. It. It's, man. Been, it's been a minute. Yeah, like almost like 20 years. Yeah, I haven't uh, spoken to you in a, in a while. When I went yeah. to Vegas, we we definitely kind of like we we would bump into each other once in a while in New York, but it was definitely it's been a while since I yeah. since I spoke to you. <laughs> <laughs> How yeah, you, a few a few years, a few pounds, right? You know yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you were you were my first connection to Philly, you know, and so okay, I, I met you in New York. You were my first connection to Philly. You taught me about the word John. I was like, what the fuck is this dude talking about? You <laughs> was introducing me to Philly steaks. We I remember we would all. Uh, you like um, eleven Ayers? We would all take a caravan trip to Philly, right? We would road trip, yeah. We would road trip to Philly for for your gigs. I would check you out. I think it was Nick. Was it Nick Catch Dubs that would Catch Dubs? He he was there as well a few times. There was like a bunch of you know all of the homies within kind of that scene, right? And all all the DJ homies and whatnot. You know, especially all the all, all the dudes in New York when we were all living there. You know, Philadelphia being. You know, it's 90, 90 minutes away, yeah. give or take some, give me traffic, right? You know what I'm saying? And a lot of people always don't realize how close proximity it is, right? You know, mm-hmm. so, you know, it's like one of those things that we would like come down and you come to Philly, it would be like a little mini vacation for uh, for, for folks in New York. And right. it was a lot of wilding out. It was a lot of drinking, Yeah, you know? <laughs> I, remember, I remember you stole a pillow from that nightclub denim one did time, we? Did <laughs> which was so, he was so. I mean, I don't want to like put you on blast, but like, yo, yo okay. B, you were so, you were so blacked out that like somehow you, you, there was like it was one of those big ass like plush pillows, yeah, yeah, right, that you find in like nightclubs, right, and you were like, this is mine, I'm taking this back to me to the crib. You know, for some for some reason, Cosmo, I don't remember that. I don't know. <laughs> my my mind blacked that shit out for for some reason. You know, where is the fuzzy pillow? Where's that pillow out there? Yeah, where's that pillow? At? I don't know. I don't know. Probably made it to New York. Probably with Ayers or something. Cosmo, you probably have that pillow. Probably left it in your whip or something, man. I don't know because I remember one time it was I had a brand new whip too, and I remember one time driving back and airs was on the on the way back airs is in the passenger seat and i'm driving and i'm like don't do it don't do it and airs is like Mm-mm, don't do it don't do it and next thing you know he's just projectile vomiting uh all on, on, on his lap and, <laughs> oh, you know yeah. Yeah, sorry. We're, you, we we hit the ground running with this conversation. This is great. You know? no, no, no. <laughs> no, this is dope. Yeah, we really got blasted up in Philly. I remember like I remember Ayers like sleeping on the concrete, bro. Like we like on the street, oh, shit, like we man. couldn't wake him up. I remember being so blacked out. And this is the great part. We would I think we were crashing at your mom's, right? Yep. So it was yep. like four to five of us just drunk in like Cosmo's living room. And like yep. we're we're just like just like these fucking degenerates in his living room, just like fucking like Philly steak cheese breath with like probably alcohol vomit and all mixed in. And I remember Cosmo's mom, like the biggest sweetheart, like putting a blanket on me and like tucking me in, like in the middle of like, <laughs> and I felt like such a piece of shit. And she was over shit. there. Like she didn't shit even I- know who the fuck I, she didn't even know. She was like, who's this drunk Asian kid on my couch? And Cosmo's mom is like tucking me in, and I was like, "Oh, I'm such a degenerate." I was like, "No, that's cool." My mom had a lot of practice with, with that, like <laughs> since when I was a teenager. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. So she already knew what time it was when we were the grown folk. You yeah, know? yeah. That's, it's yeah. Crazy. What year was this? It was uh, 2003 or two. Was 2000. Like- yeah, because I moved to New York again. So I lived lived there twice. I think it was 2002. Yeah. So it must have been like 2002, 2003. Yeah, yeah, around there. Around yeah. the first years of, because uh, also, yeah, because I was I had this residency weekly in in, in Philly uh, on a Friday. So I would drive down every Friday 
mm-hmm. and do this gig at that place, Denim. But we went to other spots as well. So yeah. it definitely was within 2002, 2003. And Cosmo, like when I would go to Philly, Cosmo was like the mayor. Like seriously, like everywhere we went, everyone was like, yo, Cosmo, what up? Yo, Cos, what up, man? And they'd be like giving him yeah, a the pound. To the city. Yeah, yeah. Like we couldn't really walk a block without somebody stopping him. And some like the most hood looking ass motherfuckers just coming up like, yo, Cos, what up, motherfucker? What up, son? Yo, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, yo, this motherfucker really, really has that Philly. Floats on water, bro. Yeah, he got that hometown love out there in Damn. Philly, you know? And I was like, yo, this dude. And you was you were probably the most Philly motherfucker that I know. And I don't know a lot of Philly motherfuckers. But <laughs> you was Philly to the death. And uh, I take that I take that so to heart. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really I, I, uh, but it's funny too because like <clears throat> you know, I, again, like, you know, growing up, like you know, Philly's got a really strange accent, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and and growing up, my mom was always like, you know, make sure that you speak properly and understand your words, all that stuff. And we couldn't say uh ain't like she was like, that's not a word. You know, or like use, because like if we say instead of like you all or you guys, it's yeah. use in Philly, right? So I would say that growing up, my mom would be like, eh, you know. So <laughs> it was always really an important thing for me to enunciate and make sure that I, you know, I, I have a, a very good and proper speaking manner and affect. Yeah. Right? You know what I'm saying? But like, I don't realize it, especially like nowadays, if I get a little tired, if I get a little drunk, like, like, that I do have a Philly accent and it, it definitely comes out, you know what I'm saying? And like, <clears throat> I don't hear it, but like people are like, damn, you know? And then sometimes I'll be like, yo, you know, yo, like, y- you know what I'm saying? Like we're going to be going, like getting some hoagies or something like that, you know? And, you know. So I say it's chumpy and all that shit. Ch- chumpy is a chumpy is a real Philly word, man. John is the word that Rich John? is talking about. Yeah. But John is like, you know what it is. So the Philly accent is like this mid Atlantic accent. But it also has kind of like this, like one toe in almost like a southern draw, which is weird, right? You know what I'm saying? Because it's a northern city, right? So it's kind of got that. And John is joint, right? So basically, it's just people saying joint, 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 John, right? And uh, got it. You know, you know what I mean? It's just kind of the the the, the bastardization of. Uh, of, of that word but now it's just like john 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 and yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a word that's definitely become like like that word's become gentrified it's, it's shit <laughs> yeah. you know no but oh, should i not curse it, on here it, yeah it's definitely like a philly thing like hella is definitely like a bay thing bay, you know yeah. what i mean like For john sure. yeah. and john could be anything from like a, a shorty to to i don't know it could be anything right like yo that's anything because yeah, 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 yeah. it's joint yeah, yeah. And yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Like I grabbed that John over at the John, and I was a John. You know what I mean? <laughs> and like, like what the fuck does that mean? But a Philadelphia person would probably be like, "Oh yeah, I know exactly what you what you just said." You know? <laughs> oh yeah, that John. Yeah, yeah. That's stupid. Stuff. It's so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to talk about look like your resume is crazy. You know what I mean? I mean, you've done the do over. You're the co-founder of the Rub. You know, um, one of the best parties in New York. I would say definitely. Uh, the top three, in my opinion, uh, in New York. Um, I want to talk about uh, Philly, you know, because I, yeah. like I said, you're the most Philly motherfucker ever, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I know your roots, like we were just talking about your moms, right? Your mom owned a skateboard shop, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In Philly. And it was like upstairs to your uncle's sporting goods. I think he had a Michelin Ness, right? Out yeah, there. yeah, yeah. So like my, he's like my play uncle, right? You know, yeah. you know, like, yeah, play on play uncle, right? Yeah. You know, so like, that's that's Peter, who was like my mom's best friend, uh, and he had Mitchell Ness, which was a sporting goods store. But right. it was before they did. It was kind of before they were doing throwbacks, and this was like this is 1984, 1985. Yeah, right. You know, so um, you know, if I remember correctly, excuse me, I was already into skateboarding at that time, and that's like you know the real like cultural holy trinity for me was like uh, skateboarding and graffiti and rap music. You know, mm-hmm. those are the three things that, like, growing up a shorty in, in Philly in the 80s, right, you know, that's what was, like, kind of all around you, right? You know what I'm saying? So uh, my mom actually, at one point, I, it was, like, said to me, like, my mom's stepdad were like, yeah, we're going to open up a store. What kind of store do you think we should open up? And there wasn't any skateboard stores in Philly wow. at all. So, um, you know, I just was like, you know, I'm a shorty. I'm fucking around. And I said, yeah, mom, you should open up a skateboard store. And then, like, a couple months later... She was like, "Hey, guess what? We're opening up a skateboard store." So, like, wow, that definitely like made me like 
cool kid. Right. I was gonna. <laughs> I was just gonna say like you must have yeah. been one of the coolest kids out there, and that shit must have been like the illest hangout, right, for all the skate. Oh, it was the craziest hangout. The funny thing is, like at least within the skate community at that time, like skateboarders were like we're like the rejects, right? Mm-hmm. We were like not the cool kids. The skateboarders were like the were the the rejects. They were like the the rejects, right? Yeah. You know. So they, like they, was, they they weren't the jocks, they weren't the nerds. There wasn't a classification right. for them yet. They were like the outcasts. Yeah, right. they were the, the outcasts, outcasts, the outsiders. Right. Yeah. And the outsiders, absolutely right. You know what I'm saying? So kind of with that in the skateboard community, at least in the eighties, uh was like kind of this amalgamation of all different types of people. Right. Boys, girls, black, white, Asian, right? Mm-hmm. But they were all about, you know, just kind of skating and into graffiti, because that was actually the first thing I was into as a shorty shorty. You know, I wasn't even ten, and I was like trying to write. I feel you know? like I feel like everyone in our generation was like graph writing. Like, never you probably yeah. was doing graph, right? I was, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> like everybody was. It was like you was graph writing, or you was like selling weed. Like everyone always sold weed or something. <laughs> or, or, yeah. yeah. or both. Or both. Or both. Or doing Sorry, both. Mom. Yeah. <laughs> that, at the time, that was like probably the, the equivalent of now, like kids wanting to be YouTubers, right? It was oh just yeah, like yeah, doing yeah. graph. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like doing TikToks was doing graph, and YouTubing was like selling weed or doing some shit. Or probably like reselling is probably the selling of weed of what we were doing. But yeah, <laughs> that's pretty now, crazy, yeah. man. So you you were probably like you already built your notoriety from being like the cool skater kid, you know, from the skate shop, right? Whose mom owned it and shit like that. And then you started DJing, How did, and then you just got into DJing out there in Philly. And I want to talk about this because uh, we were doing some research, and you, you started doing clubs at 16? Yeah, 16, Philly? 17, something wow. like that. Yeah, yeah. That's fucking crazy. Well, it was weird, though, because, like, I, I, get, I, can't, I, got, I got, like, I was always collecting music, right? Even before I was had turntables, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I guess technically this is 2020, right? So this marks, like, the 30th year of me being behind turntables. Wow. Right? So, like... You know, it wasn't really that far of a stretch for me to kind of go like, all right, cool. This is something that I'm really into to like, all right, let me just kind of take it to the next level. And I get one turntable and then you save up, get another turntable. And yeah, yeah. That piece of shit, like realistic mixer. And I <laughs> had one of them. One of the first turntables I had was one of the old joints, which had like, do you remember the joints that were like your grandma's turntable where they had that like metal arm where you could stack the fucking things and it was supposed to like. Oh was, hell yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was I'm terrible. <laughs> it was terrible. So like, you know, so I was like, you know, you know, I learned on that shit, but then like, you know, probably by the time I was 16, 16, 17, like like I was doing like a shit ton of house parties at high school, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and um and that was cool because like I was always a bit of a socially awkward dude, right? It's interesting how many DJs that I know actually had some sort of adolescent awkwardness. And, you know, also, I think that there's so much of like a like a nerd quotient for a lot of us. Right. Which allows us to kind of get into this the way that we do in the first place. Right. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, being like socially awkward, there's all these girls that like I didn't know how to talk to girls. Right. You know, it's weird being around crowds and whatnot, you know, but being a DJ, finally, like it kind of gave me that like cool cred. And also, like I knew all the shit that nobody else did in, in, in school, but it also gave me an opportunity to like kind of be up in the social environment and be at a party. But also, I'd be like in my own little space, right? You know what I'm saying? So, like, it was like it was a win-win for me. And then it just ended up becoming really, you know, it's a funny thing because it was actually Espo because I was friends with him since I was like a kid, right? Oh, wow. He was a bit older than me, and he was doing a, a a loft party somewhere in town where he was. He had a band called Stepping Razor, right? And I was DJ before and after, and. Now, even back then, I was playing oldies. You know, I'm playing, like, War and Mandrill and Roy Ayers and shit like that, you know? So, like, shit yeah. that I like. And this one dude, Bob, they called him the Nature Boy, was like, yo, all right, I'm going to book you for this club. And it was this club called Revival. Now, Revival was straight up, like, in Philly in the 90s, Revival was straight up, like, the limelight. Like, it was, like, after hours, mad debaucherous, mad debaucherous. You know, like, all sorts of drugs and sex and, like, you know, like freak freakiness, just woo. You know, and I'm like 16 or 17, and like, I'm like oh shit, this is. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, anyway, they to, so they used to always have to come and try to sneak me in the back door, right? And the bouncers were like, "Who the fuck is this? Come on, like, sure." I'm like, listen, I'm like, imagine me at 16. I mean, I got a baby face right now in my 40s. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm like at 16, I was a ba- like baby face. You know, and they're like, "Who the fuck is this?" Right? And they're like, "No, he's cool." Sigmund, and then like, 
I would start playing and like, you know, I'd be playing like, again, like all those oldies, like the classics, right? And my officers would be like, check this guy out, right? And then also, and also, also like hip hop too, right? And there were uh, most downtown clubs at the time weren't playing any, any rap music at all. Right. It was all dance music. Yeah. So that's fucking, it, it's, it's weird. Like, hearing about motherfuckers DJing in clubs at like 8, 16. Because it's like, I can't even I'm fathom right, yeah. being in the club at fucking 16. And you yeah, was doing that real. shit. And then, yeah, it's it's, weird. Like, tell me about this it, party, man, that you got, that you started with King Brit. Was it like Back to Basics? Oh, Back to Basics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's King's party. King yeah. Dog, right? And like, this is the party that was like, basically the Philly equivalent of like Giant Step, right? Mm-hmm. So like you know they would be playing King would be playing all this cool different sh- shit and and also like jazzy house and then also like you know classics like you know the, the funk classics and the soul classics that are now considered within the pantheon of like you know what you would hear out in a classic set uh, you know in, for any DJ right you know yeah, yeah. I, I I couldn't get in that you know what I mean and this one bouncer named Big J this dude was like seven foot tall right. And I always like thought I was a badass and they're trying to be like badass to this guy who's literally seven feet tall, you know. Fuck out of here, kid, right? <laughs> so I would just like sit outside of the club, you know, and like just listen for like hours on end, just checking it out, checking it out, right? You know what I'm saying? And just and then um one day when I was DJing at, at uh the downstairs of revival, which was the after hours I was talking about, you know, King came in and he sat down in like this chair, like right in literally right in front of me. So I'm like, fuck. You know, all right, all right, cool. I got I to gotta make sure I'm doing okay, right? You know what I mean? And I'm playing like, you know, I'm playing like organized confusion records and fucking James Brown and weird shit like that, you know? And he finally was just like, yo, man, like, somebody speaks to you, like, yo, man, like, yo, you're playing some really far, far out stuff, man, out of sight. And I'm like, yeah, thanks, man. <laughs> and somehow the, the topic of how much I was getting paid came up, right? And he says, how much are they paying you here to do this? And I told him the truth. I said, they're paying me $35 a night to, to DJ here, which literally was like a four-hour set, right? right, you know right. Wow. It's crazy. And I was just like, you know I mean? I really didn't know any better. I didn't know better. Just getting you know? started. Yeah, you're just trying to get your foot in the door. So I'm Trying to get my foot in the door, right? You know what I'm saying? And so then it was, at that point, he was like, listen, you're going to come and you're going to do a guest set with me at my party, Back to Basics, which was the spot that I used to sit in front of, right? So... Uh, I remember that night, it was like a January night, 92, maybe 92, maybe 93. It was about that time, 92, 93. Wow. Um, and I came in and like, they were doing like, you know, again, like they play all the funk, they play the soul, they play the jazzy stuff, the acid jazz shit, right? And I came in and I just played straight hip hop, you know, and just fucking smash, smash it, smash it, right? You know what I mean? And so then he was just like, all right, cool, yo, that's right. You're coming back in like three months and I'm gonna book you again, right? You know, Mm-hmm. He booked me again, right? Came back, you know. I do what I do, right? <laughs> and, then, and then just kind of flex a little bit more, right? You know what I'm saying? And then finally, he was just like, yo, listen, all right, well, listen, you're coming on. You're going to be the new resident, you know? And it was also cool, it was smart with him because, like, I mean, I'm going to say it was with all humility, but he was just like, oh, look, there's this young cat on the scene who's really on the come up, who's really doing shit, like, properly. Right. So I'm going to take him and take him under my wing. So it was like smart for him to do that. Right. You know what I'm saying? And also kind of nurtured my career, my development and our relationship as well. And that's still like my homie to this day. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. um, and that without question, I mean, because like that's when I met. I mean, I had met Amir Questlove like before that him and Tariq because they would, you know, we'd hang out in South Street. Right. They were always playing on, on the on, on the sidewalks at the layup, which was like this hip hop shop that everybody hung out at. Um, Damn. Yeah. And you're like, and that was like, you know, I knew those guys from high school too. You know, they were a little bit older than me as well, but uh-huh. you know, the layup was this hip hop shop that, so it was tramp who was the guy who did the view from the underground uh, comic that was in source. Right. It was my man, Robbo who's in Portland now. And he was, uh, he was, uh, he does a lot of design for, for Nike for Rob. And now he's one of the head designers for Adidas uh, my man Alim, who was, he was like, he was from Uptown, so he was like the mixtape connect. He would bring the mixtapes down to Philly, right? And um, who am I forgetting? Keith. Uh, Keith. So those are the four four owners of the layup. I know I'm bouncing around a little bit. That's Keith awesome. is now the, Keith's the, the tour manager of The Roots. He's been the tour manager for 20 years, right? Yeah. Um, so this is like the hip-hop shop, and all the all the homies have come down, all the graffiti writers have come down, all the hip-hop heads have come down. Like, I remember when 
Echo Unlimited first came out. It was like these T-shirts, right? They had like a mixtape on the on the hand tag and whatnot, and <laughs> wearing wearing triple five soul and shit like that. And they had turntables in the back, you know. So I would just come down as a shorty, and I bring my records, and I just DJ for the for the hip hop heads at the hip hop shop, you know. And that's how I met Questlove and and uh and, and three because Amir would be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna come down to DJ too. So him and I became like friends DJing there. This is before they were the Roots. They were the Square Roots at that time. Oh, they were called so, the Square um, Roots. <laughs> square Roots, yeah. So was Scott um, was Scott Storch in the band at this point? Or yeah, Scott was part of the band. It was Scott, Scott was Scott. It was this kid Josh Abrams who was a uh, um, uh, the bass player. Yeah. Um, he was also because the, they went to the Kappa, which was Creative Performing Arts. It's like the it's like you know that you know the Fame School in New York. I'm about right? to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like the Philly version of that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and I think uh, yeah, and like I think Rich. I think Rich Nichols, RIP, he was managing them right around the same time, or AJ Shine, who was one of the guys on uh, college radio. And he was the guy that brought Scott Storch in. Um, so this was like probably like 93, 90, 92, 93. That's crazy. And so, like again, like those guys, like Amir would, Amir would DJ at, uh, at Back to Basics 2 and a lot of other of the homies. So it was a real, real tight, like Philly community yeah. in that, that era of the the early to the mid 90s i was gonna say we, i was gonna say was philly like really that small where everyone just kind of co-mingled like that was am in the mix was diplo kind of everywhere in the mix Did, was everyone kind of just like, like mighty Mai? yeah was mighty yeah, well, there? well my my i knew milo from from grade school right mm -hmm. and like that's how i met shecky because i met shecky before he was John, I met, I met John Schechter before he was Shecky uh, Green. Yeah, yeah, Shecky yeah. Green. Yeah, because actually he was going out with uh, one of my homies. One of my homies from from Hebrew school, he was going out with his older sister, right? And I remember meeting Shecky. Well, this is even before he started The Source, too, right? And like it was like, oh, yeah, this is my sister's old, uh, boyfriend, he was going to college at the time, I think, and he had a record out called BMOC, which stands mm -hmm. for Big Metal Campus, right? And it was uh, Kevy Kev and Sultan MC. Sultan MC was John Schechter's rap name. So um, I met him then, but also Milo went to the same high school as them, grade school, high school, which was Friend Select. So I knew Milo and Eric, who was, uh, you know, Eon. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Before the, Eric was Eric was not Mr. Eon. He was MC Magnum. I believe. Hey, yo. Yeah. Crazy name. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and, and Adam was also, AM was also homies with us as well and would hang out. But this is before he moved to Cali. Because he moved to Cali, I think, in like when he was like 14 or 15. So like we were friends for years leading up to that. And wow. um, Crazy, then him and I reconnected when I had my residency in Vegas in like 99 or 2000. So. It's such a it's such a crazy like everyone came up together kind Tight of way. Lit, man. And yeah, then yeah, it just yeah. kind of all blew up like separately. It's kind of nuts, man. What was going well, on? Well, it's like Philly's like this it's a really tight knit community. It still is, you know. It's like it's also like it's a it's a really big little town, yeah. right? Yeah. If that makes sense. And we're big. We're we're one point six million people and it's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. They fifth fifth or sixth largest in the country, but it still has that like kind of small town vibe, you know. You're, so you, you're you're in Philly right now. You're back in Philly, right? You've been yeah. I've been back in Philly since I think like 2013. Right. How, yeah. How's how's the how's the temperament right now? How's everything right now? I've just seen a lot of like crazy ass videos on Twitter about you know all of these Philly motherfuckers, and I would say they they look they look like you know the neighborhood they neighborhood dudes like protecting like the Columbus uh the Christopher Columbus statues like oh, wilding them, the fuck yeah. out them, yeah them, them assholes oh yeah yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. but I, but I but I see you I see you being active like you're you're out there BLM repping uh you know what I'm saying protesting peep the shirt peep the shirt yeah yeah you've been out there um yeah, man. how how's yeah, the Philly how's the temperament in Philly right now I mean I think it's the same way everywhere right you right. know at least in major cities right you know what I'm saying uh you have a lot of people that are are either very active or very vocal about some really important issues that we are dealing with and have never dealt with mm -hmm. as a country. Yeah. Right. And you have some a we have a really small, really small pocket of people who are vehemently against 
basically the right side of history, right? You know what I'm saying? Right. And, mm-hmm. you know, those people are way smaller than or the groups and the, the, the population of, 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 of people who believe in the antithesis of what it is that people like us are speaking out about and fighting for mm-hmm. are way smaller, but they're way louder because they need to be because they know that their time is up. And that's also partly what it is that we're looking at uh, about just the backlash uh, of white fragility, white supremacy and racist and racist attitudes and temperament throughout the country Mm -hmm. that the people who are the white supremacists or people who don't want to let go of their white supremacy, right. Understand that the country is changing and it's changing in a way that can't ever go back. Right. You know what I'm saying? Just look look at the fucking numbers. Mm -hmm. Right. You know what I'm saying? And look at the youth. The youth are so incredibly inspiring. You know what I'm saying? So the reason why the, the, the people are so loud is because they understand that their time is running out. Mm-hmm. They're trying to get the last gasp in before their shit is kaput. You feel me? Yeah. So like, that's one of the reasons why I'm like, all right, that's when we keep up the fight. We keep up the momentum. We keep on pushing. You know what I'm saying? Because these assholes, you know, and granted, it's not going to be overnight, but you know, now granted through the, the, the spec, the, 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 the lens of looking at it through the media, you might think that it's kind of crazy, you know, especially when you saw what happened in, in, you know, May, May 30th, May 31st and June 1st. Um, but that shit was happening all across the country anyway. Right. But mm-hmm. Philadelphia definitely has a, a, a flair for the dr- dramatic, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And we're also goalie as fuck here. We're very goalie, you know, we're very grimy. Right. It's a grime city. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, but like, you know, shout out to the homies who are out there, you know, out there every day, every day, right. every day, mm-hmm. pushing for it, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, and, um, don't you think, you know, um, don't you think Twitter gives like all of these, like basically gives all of these kind of like, uh, it gives motherfuckers a bigger platform than they deserve. Don't oh, you hell think? Yeah. And I oh, think, yeah. I think, I think back in the 90s and the 80s, there was a, there was definitely the 90s. There was a lot of racist motherfuckers and a lot of white supremacists, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. but like everyone ignored them. Kind of, it wasn't like you know what I'm saying. It was, it was just kind of, and they just became less powerful to me. It, yeah, it definitely amplifies it for sure, for sure. And also, you you got to remember that you know the racists and white supremacists and, and those motherfuckers have always been around since forever. I right? mean, I don't, you know? I don't think it's ever going to go away. I think it's they're always going to be racism. There's always going to be prejudice. But I just think, I don't think it's going to change in my lifetime. That's for sure. It definitely you know? not, not definitely not in our lifetimes. But I do yeah. feel like everyone is giving a lot of these motherfuckers a larger platform yeah. on Twitter by getting upset about everything they're saying when they kind of should ignore it. But that's just my opinion. I feel like if you, well, I feel like when you give them the attention, it's valid. If they feel like they they're being validated, do you know what I'm saying? I I do understand yeah. that. I think that it doesn't necessarily have to be mutually exclusive. I totally believe in and agree with you right. that that platforming mm-hmm. people who have these particular opinions and giving them a voice box is a way of empowering them yeah. right so yeah. not giving them that is mm-hmm. a way of taking away that power yet at the same time it doesn't necessarily have to be mutually exclusive you can actually take that position and at the same time when you do see something or if you do catch somebody slipping on some bullshit yeah you know it's the it's the it's the responsibility, especially the responsibility of white folk, to fucking call out other white folk. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because it's the it's the mess that white folk fucking made in the first place. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So it's their job to fucking fix it. You know what I'm saying? So like you could do both. Now with like Twitter and Facebook and all that shit. You know what I'm saying? The thing about it is, if you think about back in the day when there was all these people who are racist and anti-Semites and bigots and homophobes and all that shit, all that, all that shit, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, they probably kept it under wraps because they were afraid of being outed and being afraid of being ostracized within communities, especially within, like, the rap community or really more so in, like, the hardcore punk rock community, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And they would keep their shit under wraps because they were embarrassed, right? But now you have a, a situation where they feel emboldened to talk this shit because they can do it with the anonymity of it's a keyboard warrior thing, right? Yeah. They could do it with just kind of talking behind a, you know, talking behind a, a fake ass egg avatar, right? You know what I'm saying? Or some anime shit, right? <laughs> when they know that back in the day that you come up with that, that you're going to get your face rocked. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you can't even come with that shit. So 
You feel what I'm saying. I feel what you're saying. I, I also Perfect. like, you know, I, I saw you going kind of going back and forth with Joe Maz. And everyone, <laughs> I was wondering if this is gonna come up. Yo, oh, yeah, no, no, I mean, <laughs> we had Joe Maz on the podcast, and I and I chose deliberately not to focus on his political, you know, uh, and choice. beliefs, and, and you know that was my choice to just yeah. kind of focus on him as a DJ producer. Do you know sure, what I'm yeah. saying? Because because oh, yeah. the, the thing is, like, I'm in a place where I I I don't really agree with a lot of motherfuckers on what they do. But that doesn't mean I'm going to label someone as like, you know, an outright bastard, you know, low down motherfucker. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I think <laughs> I think ignorance, like, I don't I don't want to, like, beat the shit out of someone for being ignorant. I kind of want to educate them and I want to find a common ground with somebody. Yeah. That's my thing. I'd rather find a common ground with somebody. But I don't I obviously don't agree with a lot of Joe Maz and shit, but I also don't um, I don't react to, it, i don't react to anything he does on twitter because i feel like that will just really make the amplify. situation worse and amplify what he's saying even more if that makes yeah. any sense but i do understand you being enraged or like you know you wanting to fight you know kind of oh, go, go back to that i'm not know. enraged i don't even think about, i don't even think about the cat i don't yeah. even know the cat <laughs> i didn't even, 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 even heard of him Hold on. No, bust this though. I had never even heard of him. Ooh, spicy. And then and then I realized after the fact that I had a few of his remixes in my iTunes, and that's when I put two and two together, right? Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. never heard of him. And then on Twitter was something that was happening. And I guess somehow I was somebody who was a homie of mine came at it, right? Trace. Trace, right? Yeah, Trace. You know, yeah. Trace yeah. gets into it, right? You know? Yeah. So anyway, so, Trace, so, Trace gets really into it. Like No, he he, he thugs <laughs> it out. And that's my dog. Sometimes I want to I want to be like, yo, tr they, they trains, it's cool, man. Take a breath, bro. Nah, no, he's slugging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, but it's funny, though, because I didn't even really know Cat, uh, Joe Maz. I, I never even heard of him. And then Trains came out, right? And yeah. then I looked at the whole thing, and he was talking about, Joe Maz was talking about something, uh, I forget what it was, a, a COVID. It was COVID. It was, mm -hmm. all, it was all having a, the out era of COVID, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, like, he was sending out some, he, and this was a while ago. He was sending out some 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 fake news. He was sending out some fraudulent numbers, right? right you know. Right. So then I responded back to him, Joe Maz. I was just like, "Yo, check this out!" Like with all due respect, and I sent him like three or four or five like links with reputable, credible information, like Reuters, Associated Press, that mm -hmm. like debunked the shit that he was talking. Right. So then he was like, "Oh, my bad. I'm sorry. It's all good. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this to light." And so I was like, cool. So then he followed me and I followed him, right? You know, and then. Um, so it was nice. It was I, nice in the beginning. It was nice. Yeah, it was fine. It was like, <laughs> I found the common I, ground. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't even know, I didn't even know Cat, right? So then, so then what happened was months later, he went on some shit, which was again like wilding, like wilding. Yeah. On some conspiracy theorist shit, right? And um, it's kind of it's kind of manic sometimes, right? A little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very, a little it feels, bit. Feels, it feels very manic. Yeah, yeah. Um, Wall, which, which is why I, I don't really acknowledge it or I, I don't you know I don't approach it, attention to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah because yeah, I yeah. feel like there's something a little you know but go ahead yeah, go, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean like again like I like I don't really engage with it at all either you know but in the right. second case it was it was him throwing out some stuff and then I said hey dude and if I can remember correctly I know it's all on the internet everything's on the internet forever I said hey dude like you know that's an outright, outright lie and then like he's he said that I was lying and so then when I went back, I took screenshots of the original conversation that we had. And I was like, oh, check out the receipts, buddy. You know? Mm. And he was like, and he was like salty and then tried to deflect. And then he like unfollowed me or oh, I unfollowed wow. him, whatever. Like, you know, whatever. Damn. You know? Some petty shit happened there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So like I basically was like call him out, right? Uh -huh. So like, anyway, so with that guy, yeah, I don't even know him. I don't even know nothing about him. Yeah. I know that he's yeah. on twitter and he says a lot of wild shit yeah um i don't really check <laughs> him i know that my man flip out had said something yesterday which was funny and i laughed at it and then joe maz went at me and he'll go at me too like he'll look at my feed and i'm just like bro yeah. i don't yeah. know you know what i mean so mm -hmm. you know, sensitive but, thugs yeah. sensitive but, thugs it's like but, but coswell you posted some shit where you said um you can't wait to hit a brand new ice cube and dj oh, that's right, right? <laughs> so I'm going to do my 
Yo, he got mad with that shit. <laughs> he got mad. He got mad. Yeah, I'm sorry. Truth hurts, bro. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Cosmo, did, did you delete all his remixes from your laptop or what? Well, they never were in my laptop in the first place. They were just on my. They were on my desktop where I keep most of my music. I don't. I'm not gonna play those remixes. <laughs> uh, well, you're not. I mean, you're not. What in, am I gonna do? You're not play in a, a fucking like a future remix, fucking dubstep, fucking joke, tropical <laughs> dubstep, future feature. Fuck yeah, out yeah, of well, well, you're not. Tip, you're not typically in the rooms that would require you to play those remixes anyway. Those are like kind nah. of bottle, big bottle, big room bottle service rooms. You know what I mean? Exactly. And that, no. That's actually the difference when I remember meeting you in New York in the 2000s, right? I remember like you, 11 Ayers with the rub and me, yeah. I was like kind of the sellout. I was already like, I was in the bottle service uh, clubs playing like all the, the Bon Jovi Guns N' Roses and, and then trying to mix in hip hop and shit. And you guys are really, you guys were always on that good music shit. So then you guys, when you guys did invite me to do the rub, I would be like, I would be so happy to, to just go there and just play all this. Bro, I remember, bro, I remember, the, I remember the first time, the first night you played, man, you fucking smashed that shit. Uh, and it was the first time I heard you too. We had known each other. Yeah. We'd hung out, but I'd never actually heard you play. Um, and this is vinyl days. This is the vinyl days, I remember. I think I brought yeah, 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 it was yeah. To, to, totally vinyl. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and you just came in, you fucking smashed it. I was like, oh shit, Rich. Uh, I was like, damn, Rich really took it to school. Because you brought a lot of that element to the rub. Now, like at the rub, like we were like, I mean, obviously we all know what the rub is, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, we were yeah. definitely the, kind of like, it's making shit cool and making shit like alternate than what was happening in big clubs, you know, but you brought that, like you brought that energy and you also brought that approach. You also played like, you didn't play like Bon Jovi, but mm -hmm. you also played like big records, yeah, yeah. right? And like, you did it with like conviction, which the way that you are as a DJ, a dope ass DJ, I just put that for, for, for the mean, record. Yeah. You know, crooked dope I ass mean, DJ. Right? I mean, compared to you guys, it was like it was it was I was out of my element, but it was like it was dope to I was always dope to hear you guys play, and like I remember I loved your reggae sets, um, and it was it was just I, the, I, it's hard to explain the rub at that time because it was so special. It was such a dope party, and I feel oh, like man. there's so many versions of the rub now that it's like oh, but. You gotta understand, in the early two thousands, this these these parties didn't exist. Like this was a rare, special thing, and now it's kind of like a little yeah, like throwback R and B parties. You have all these little good music parties here, but it was not a thing like back then. It was just a very rare and special thing. Um, but it was I, I remember all of these memories. I think I got really drunk one time and I was on the mic and I was just, and, 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 or and then they, they, they kind of banned me from ever being on the mic ever again. Yeah. I remember he even pulled me aside like one night after he was just like, yo man, you, you know, you got to chill out. You got to relax. And I was like, yeah, my bad, my bad. I think we were just wilding out back then. I remember I just kept going like on the mic let me hear say, oh, 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 old oh, school. And he'd be like, oh, 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 old school. <laughs> I was doing all this like this like old school 80s New York shit on the mic and whatnot. But it was it was such a great time back then. And um I I I, I want to talk about the rub a little bit, you know, when yeah. you, and, and how you actually came from Philly to New York. Because your your story going you went back and forth from Philly, New York, Philly, and been back to New York. And then Yeah, yeah. I didn't even know that you worked at um, Eight Ball Records, which is crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I moved to f New York in like '94, right? Mm -hmm. And it was um, wow that that uh, early, huh? '94. Yeah, I was, living, I was living in New York at Williamsburg of all places. It was before Williamsburg, as you know it, right? Williamsburg. Yeah. Right? It was actually it was actually Williamsburg Bushwick border. Do you remember that? Remember that White Castle that was off of Metropolitan? No, 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 I don't know Brooklyn. Right. I don't know Brooklyn. I never like fucked around right, right, cool. <laughs> that part. Of that's a deep, deep cut <laughs> reference. You know what I'm saying? Me, me, uh, and, me and Neva are like Manhattan, Uptown, Bronx. So yeah, like, yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's like when you and never went down there. Yeah, we, okay. we didn't. We didn't venture to East New York like that. that, that if I went to Brooklyn, I'd be in a park slope. <laughs> that was yeah, it. no, no, park slope. 
<laughs> no, but we was like 94, and I was living with uh, Max Glazer was my roommate. Me, I saw Max. that. Yeah, wow. That's crazy. Uh, Max Glazer. Shout out to Max Glazer. He's, shout out to Max. He's one yeah. of my favorite dance hall DJs of all time. For real. One of my favorite yeah. dance hall DJs, one of my, one of my dearest friends, mm-hmm. longest friends, you know what I'm saying? It was me, Max, with John Creamer, and uh, Conrad, and we were, we were, uh, we were roommates. I was, was that's Conrad, the um, promoter? That's Conrad Corelli. I don't know if... Uh, he does promotion, but he used to do a... So he used to do a lot of engineering for like uh, uh, Danny Teneglia and a lot of the house. Oh, wow. Okay. Houses that's like that, right? You know? And that was like kind of how I got my break into DJing in New York in the 90s, which was like through 8-Ball. 8-Ball was like, you know, the jazzy record label with also the, the, the you know, the, the acid jazz and shit like that. And... Um, okay, wait. So... Two things. Number one, yeah. how did you get a job at Eight Ball Records? And then number two, Eight Ball Records was like a jazzy record store in the nineties, but in the two thousands, I knew it as like the the dance house record store. Like that was the Eight Ball was the place to go to get the newest dance house records oh, and yeah. all that, that oh, shit. Yeah. But yeah. I didn't and know that in the nineties it was like a, a jazz, like a jazz. Yeah, yeah, well they had like acid they would have like acid jazz. Acid you know? jazz. Like that whole thing, and it was like jazzy house and shit like that, you know? Right, okay. Um, but that was also like, you know, kind of in like 94, 95, 96, when all of that stuff was becoming kind of blurred, right? So like, you know, I was working there, because John, our other roommate, was was working there at the shop. He got me a job a few days there working at the shop, and then I got a job working at the label. Um, and it was out being, it was being at the label, which allowed me to kind of get into like a lot of clubs, like, Sound Factory Bar and Palladium and wow. Tunnel and all that stuff because, like, I got into, like, dance music. I was into dance music, but, you know, they would have it so that, like, I was, being the, I was like, the young kid, right? So they made me run all the gopher, uh, gopher errands. So they would, like, they would cut an acetate of, like, a new cut, you know, a new dance song, right? And they would give it to me and be like, all right, you go to... Go to Palladium and drop this off to David Morales. You know, go to Sound Factory Bar and drop this off to Louis Vega. You know, or drop this off to Frankie Knuckles, right? So, like, I would be the guy that would go, young kid. I think I wasn't even 21. I think I may have been, like, 20. That's crazy. Right? And, like, so they would they would send me, and I would go, and I would be like, oh, here you go, Mr. Knuckles. Here's the new release from April. <laughs> That's so blah, crazy. Blah, blah, blah. And, he, and they'd be all like, you know, like, ooh, like, hey, who's this, like, hot young kid you know what i'm saying but like, we're like, right, like i mean it's like let's, let's keep it real right you know what I'm but you know but, um <laughs> no, 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 wait, 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 wait. he added the hot I'm young to the freaking knuckle saying that to you wait wait you know much, are you, much are you, love much love and i was like wait wait wait, wait. Are, you, are you saying <laughs> Cosmo, wait. man i love this girl are you saying you was a hot piece of ass at that time for these motherfuckers <laughs> Right? <laughs> still am, still am, Brooklyn. Still am. I've, 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 I've matured like, like a, like a fine wine. <laughs> Yo, I'm wow. a high young guy. <laughs> no. No. Frankie, Frankie, no, it's, it's Frankie Knuckles trying to smash. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, man, man, that shit, shit is real. That's the no, it's funny Knuckles. though because like Kevin, Kevin Williams was the A and R. He knew what he was doing, sending me out in the club. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that you know, baby face killer, bro. Baby face killer, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but it was funny though because it was cool because like I started getting on the circuit where I would go there, and then eventually they would kind of get to know me, and then like. Okay, yeah. Do you want to DJ in the downstairs lounge? Do you want to do you want to open up the first hour and shit like that? So, you know, it was out of that that I had like a really good opportunity to start DJing uh, in New York clubs. And then, like, you know, you're 20, 21, you want to be out at a nightclub every night. So I would out, I was out every night. You know what I'm saying? And so it was also like because I've always been to dance music, but I've always been into hip hop. I mean, that's hip hop brought me here, right? Um, so then it was also like in the downtown scene where I got an opportunity to, uh, to DJ at this place called uh, Den of Thieves, who then went through a couple of different uh, incarnations. It was Idlewild and then it was White Rabbit. I, I, um, no, actually, I DJed at both Den of Thieves and when it turned into Idlewild. I did. Okay. Business, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I some other names also. I forgot that. There were some other names too. So like my yeah. friends, Rob and, John, uh, Rob and Jim were the guys that owned it. And Rob, who's older than me, he was the first guy to be like, oh, I like your style. Like, come in and start DJing, right? You know what I'm saying? And then eventually he gave me every every Saturday night, which would be fucking lit. And mm-hmm. it was like, think about like, it was such a special time too, because you think about like, 
94, 95, 96, and you're playing at like a popular downtown cool like da- the dance club, right? You mm-hmm. know, and like you're thinking about like at that time, like you're playing a new records, right? So like here's a new record that's out, and you're gonna drop it. It's a brand new record. Oh, it's just Shook Noise Part Two, right? I'm about to say oh, that the Mob Deep, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna play a new record. Oh, it's juicy, you know. Yeah. It's more like you know what I'm saying. So like to be DJing in New York for like a good crowd. And like at that time, at that era, when the, that was the that was the records that you were playing, and then I would also play like soul and funk and shit like that, and dance, right? You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. it was a real special time. Uh, and then like also like got a chance to know everybody, like 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 met Ronson because Ronson was playing on the t- Tuesdays. He had the yeah, sweet- actually the first time I heard Ronson was at Den of Thieves, and he was going by the name of um, Spark Ronson, Mar- Mark the Spark, Mark Spark, the Spark. Spark. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. he was actually. The first time I heard him, he was kind of hate to say this, but he wasn't the greatest DJ. He, like, <laughs> he, he knew what he wanted to do. He knew exactly. what he wanted to do. And he, was, you know, he had the vision down. He had the vision. He had down. it, but nah. But after a while, he de- he definitely fucking started. But yo, that party. was the rumor back then that there was that was that Mark Ronson was a horrible DJ. And then when I heard him, I was like, yo, he's good. So I was like, I don't know what the fuck y'all talking about. That was the beginning, but he definitely got better, man. Yeah, yeah. Like, 90, like 94, 95 is when he really first started coming out. And he was doing stuff there. And then they moved it. Because that was Sweet Thing, right? That was a Sweet Thing Tuesdays, right? Yeah, it was, yeah. And, and then they moved it to exactly. Canal Room, was it? Canal oh, Room. Canal and then, Room, wow. And then they moved it to Rebar. Rebar, that's right, right, right. So I, I used to be there all the time. And I always think about it's funny how, you know, what the DJs play at the club affects what goes on the radio because you know a lot of them dudes puffy would be there you know what i'm saying yeah. Hit, and they would all, all be the like, rappers all the producers oh, yeah. so like so ronson wow. would be playing a lot of those records that eventually ended up becoming the things that were sampled so exactly. kind of in the reverse way right you know and yeah. same thing with with saturdays with with my saturday like you know i'd be playing shit and there'd be like luminaries there and whatnot and it was it was fun and then like we all would end up kind of like hanging out and like djing at other people's you know you know like I remember the first time I met Stretch, I thought he was such a fucking dickhead. I was like, this dickhead, you know? <laughs> I mean, he's like, he's one of the, I, I love, I love him. I love that man. Shout out to Stretch, a dear friend of mine. But like, I was, I thought he was such an asshole. And like, Mighty Mai, that was my homie. He was doing the like Honeycomb Hideout, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's when I first um, met him. That was that place off of Astro Place, right? It was like, um, up, up under um, the restaurant Indochine. Indochine, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. I used to be there and like hanging out and shit like that. And then, um, Kind of getting back to crooked, what you were saying about the rub, me being in New York and then Philly and then New York again. So, like, my Saturday was fucking crazy. It was packed every fucking Saturday, line around the block, line around the block, nuts, right? Packed from 10 to 4, right? And by this time, I was living up, I was living like 107th in Columbus. So I was living kind of up uptown, yeah. uptown ish, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so one of those things like you you carry this is pre vinyl, of course, you know, but you're playing all sorts of shit. You're playing across the spectrum, you're playing house, hip hop, reggae, classes, whatnot. So you got six crates, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Big ass crates. And I lived on the fifth floor walk up. Oh wow. Oh and shit. it was two flights of stairs per per uh, per uh, per flight. So five That's o'clock time. in the morning. I'm hammered. I get out of the cab. Gotta, <laughs> it's a whole thing. You got to let one, one crate out the cab, one crate in the door, one crate out the thing, right? Right, right. And then, so I was fucked up, right? So anyway, I was like, shit, I need a break from this shit. So me and my girl at the time went on a vacation um, to Mexico. And then we got back. And the week I got back, I showed up for my Saturday. And I showed up at the spot. And everybody knows Den of Thieves knows. It's not a big spot, but it had a nice little size dance floor, right? Yeah, and there was there was all these sofas all throughout the dance floor, so I said to my man Rob, who's the owner, I said, "Rob, what the fuck," and he told me that while I was gone, that's when the cops came in and gave him a, a heavy ticket for it was just my first experience with what ended up being Giuliani's crackdown, oh. the dance dance floor crackdown, right? Yeah, the cabaret so, license, right? Cabaret license, right? Yeah. So we all know about what happened there, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And after a few months of not being able to really DJ, and I was disillusioned with working at 8-Ball, it was around that time I decided to move back to Philly oh. um, to go back to school, but I ended up doing all this other shit, which is probably, I don't know, another story for another time. There's a lot I did in Philly at that time, too. But then 
it was kind of a combination of all those things that were like Giuliani's crackdown, quality of life, broken windows theory, all that shit, right? And then kind of the commodification of nightlife culture in the sense of the rise of bottle service culture, right? right? And how that really kind of took away the feeling of community and the sense of kind of the togetherness, which was traditionally, again, going back to what we were talking about, like being a, a skateboarder, like a bunch of rejects, like the, 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 the clubs were for the rejects and they made a beautiful world, right? Uh-huh. And now any tech bro with, you know, a bank account can then find a space there. So it's a combination of like Giuliani and all that shit, the rise of the bottle service culture. And then unfortunately, like 9-11, Right. I always look at those three things as being like the things that really kind of changed nightlife in New York from the 70s, 80s, 90s to like that point right there to like what it is, has become for better or for worse. Wow. Right. So like there was all this crazy shit. I know you guys know. And well, it was like I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that the Giuliani crackdown, I, th- I thought it mostly affected like Times Square. I didn't know it would it, it fucked with the the nightclubs like not or like bars not having cabaret licenses and then like. Like not being able to like kind of tear it up like they could normally, you know? Yeah, what I'm yeah, yeah. It was like even like the smaller spots, and like it was like well, most of the spots that except that weren't like most of the spots that actually had any sort of like active dancing. Yeah, like they were all just like no, and they would also that would affect the way that you were playing because how are you supposed to be a DJ and then you start playing some stuff and you see people dancing and then like, oh shit, I got to make them not dance, right? You know. Just yeah. like counterproduct- counterproductive, counterintuitive, I should say. Yeah, this was the um, beginning of like having like a red siren underneath the DJ booth, right? Right, right, exactly. So like, like, I, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So like when 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 you were like just DJing regularly in the club, uh, you be you be killing it, and then when that red siren under the DJ booth went off, time to put a slow jam on. Yeah, time to put a slow jam, yeah, and could, up. the door guys would literally flick a switch uh-huh. and just warn the DJ to bring the energy down. That was that. Wow, oh, that's crazy. Yeah, that's right. I had a, I had a record which was uh, humpback whale sounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, still my shit to this day. And yeah. whenever that would happen, I would just put it on because it would be like it was ambient, you know. So yeah. people would just be like, "All right, cool." Like we don't know what the fuck's going on. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like jarring, right? And yeah. then the few times it happened, and then you could just kind of build it up. It was definitely a bitch, but you, you t- gets it takes. Yeah. takes the wind out of your sails, right? You're, you're right, though. We always had to have that Red Siren record ready. It yep. had to mm-hmm. be, like, right there to just switch on a dime. Yep, yep. Or just, like, a little light bulb that would go off or something like that. Right, it right. Actually, like, an actual light bulb. Yep, yep. Under the thing. Yeah. Or even that. sometimes just on the wall. Yeah. You know? That's it. So, that's and, that was, and that was the way that they communicated uh, because, I mean, we're, that was, this is, like, pretext. There wasn't even any texting. No. You know? But, so, like, but you know, that, there's no way, no way that the bouncers out, outside – you know, could make it through a crowd in time mm-hmm. or through the whole thing. Because once they saw the cops, it was just like, you know, game on. Mm-hmm. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, for real. For wow, what a but time. that's like, and that was like really kind of like at least my experience of like what nightlife in Manhattan at least had become in the late 90s uh, into the 2000s. Now, I was back in Philly at this time, but I still would come up to New York, you know, many times, you know, several times a year to DJ. Um, you know, again, because it's like super easy and really convenient. Um, so basically, but- you you were burnt out from Eight Ball Records, and it seemed like the club scene was just changing. So you you left New York and you went back to Philly, pretty much. Yeah, right? I wanted to go back to college, and also like you know, it's like my whole family's here, so I'd like to be around my family and shit like that. Right. And also, there probably was a girl involved. I don't want to talk about that though. You know, what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so was a girl involved. Always a girl involved, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> And then, you know, then after that, I kind of like, you know, that was like 98, you know, like 97, 98. And then it was like, we were, I immediately got into like DJing. I was DJing like six nights a week in Philly, you know. And this was right around the time when it was like, you know, like that real jazzy, like neo soul, fucking soul carrions era, all that shit was jumping off. And like we were doing like, yeah. and then like I was doing like a Monday night at this cool spot, Fluid, and then. Uh, I used to have all these guests to come in and then Rich Medina, who was like my homie, uh, he came in and then I was in this car accident that sidelined me for like a year and Rich kept it going. And then I came back and then we did this together for the longest time. And it was the remedy. The remedy. Yeah. That's a big party back then. I mean, 
Bobito, yeah, Bobito quoted as the dopest continuous hip hop party in the United States. That's 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 a big that's a big quote from someone like Bobito, yo. It's a big, yeah, it was, yeah, and it was yeah, and it was it was dope too because I mean it was like you know it was definitely like it was me on my like anti back is my anti jiggy shit. You know what I'm saying? Right, like, I'm gonna yeah. play this. I'm gonna play this. Uh, you know, it was before Raucous Records. It was before like the big rise of like in indie rap. You know what I'm saying? But it's like I'm gonna play some old school. I'm gonna play some funk. I'm gonna play some shit. You know what I mean? And like, and play some like wild shit. And like, you know. And then we would have everybody from like, you know, Jazzy Jeff. One of the, like, lots of the the a lot of the first uh, DJ sets that he would do when he first got into like getting back into DJing in front of people would be on Monday night. At you the, know, at the Remedy. At the Remedy. You know oh, what I'm wow. saying? And like, and then I'd be like, all right, like let's bring in some more people. Like AM. I had I had remember. AM was like 99, I think. Him and I had already reconnected through my residency in Las Vegas. Um, but he was always like a homie of mine. And uh, like AM was going to be in Philly. So I said, let me book this guy. Now, it's funny too, because I was friends with him and I knew that he was killing shit in Los, Los Angeles, right? I had no idea how he was going to sound, right? I had no idea what he was going to play. Uh, I was just going to give him the slot on the strength mm-hmm. of him being a homie. Mm-hmm. And also, like, yeah, because it, it, how long was it since you last heard him or like heard him play? I, uh, I mean, I had never heard him play. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. So there this you is ninety nine or two thousand. I had never heard him play, but I was getting like, oh, my friend Adam from Hebrew school, you know, he's a DJ <laughs> now. Cool, come on in, right? You know what I mean? And he came in, and and full disclosure, like I would have guests on, and if the guest was fucking up, like they'd get the hook. Yeah, I come and I'd give him the hook. Like, mm-hmm. like I'm pulled you, I pulled you. You know what I mean? So I was ready to give AM the hook, and he came in and he fucking smashed it. He smashed, he smashed it, <laughs> smashed it so hard, he smashed it. Like <laughs> funk, like funk, and like fucking ill shit, and fucking like killing it. You know? So like, it was, and it was always the type of thing, kind of much like the rub, much like do over, is that like we would have people in there, and guess in, and would be like, listen, do your thing, don't mm-hmm. like. Go, 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 get buck wild, go deep, you know? And like, shit, I remember when, like, when drama came in, drama's another friend of mine from high school. We went to high school together, you know? Wow, and this is like, drama. and this is like when he already, like, he was already in like, gangster grills and shit like that, all that mm-hmm. stuff. You'd already know yeah. that shit. But I was like, I was like, bro, come in, like, do your thing, like, do your thing. And like, he came in and just did like, it was like Neo Soul set, you know what I'm saying? Wow. And so it was kind of like, that's crazy. Yeah. And that was kind of like what we were doing with the Monday night. And um, so that was all the, the, the shit that um, we were doing. And like, you know, you know, Dilla would come through and some village would come through. Some village, they played my, my birthday party. I booked them in Bahamadia and like, you know, play, play my birthday party. You know what I'm saying? And like, so crazy. That's yeah, so it was, crazy, uh, man. It was, That's it so fun, sick. Yeah, it was fun times too, man, because they, they come in and they, they'd come in and they would, like a lot of them dudes would be in town to like record. So they, you know, Bobby would be in town recording like, mama's gun you know and then like be there on a monday and then like on a tuesday go back in the studio you know common for like like water for chocolate and all the roots and all that shit so there definitely was a at least what with rich and i were doing at that time there definitely was like the symbiotic relationship of at least i think between what it is that we were playing in the club right what a lot of those dudes that were in there in philly listening to shit coming to the club, listening to it, and then going back into the studio and making records. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I'm not saying that, you know, what we played in Monday night influenced the, you know what I'm saying? But there definitely was a, there was a community there. That but everybody- it, it's, it's a big part of, of the music because the artists were there, right? And it was like a melting yeah. pot of creatives at that time. You know, yeah. it's industry night. And that's what... That's honestly what industry nights were, right? They were kind of a melting pot for creatives because the regular, you know, consumer base crowd would come on Fridays and Saturdays. But like, yeah, but yeah, but like, yeah, but like, yeah, but like on a weekend, like on a weekday, you know, a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, it was really a time for the creatives and the industry people to come together and just hear mm-hmm. some next level shit that regular people wouldn't hear. So what you're talking about seems really accurate that you know a lot of the music being played at these parties would inspire a lot of the music we would hear later on in the next years to pass after that 
Which yeah, and like, again, it's like, you know, it was a thing where people also knew the, the reputation of what it is that we were doing on Monday night. So, like, if they were in town, they knew it was, like, the hot spot to go. So, like, right. you'd have, like, Outcast would be up in there. Lauren Hill would be up in there. You know, fucking, what's his name from, uh, you know, celebrities like uh, Dave Navarro and Val Kilmer would be up there, like, wilding the fuck out. And uh, uh, just the, Justin Timberlake and Backstreet Boys and Outcast, like, all them dudes would, would be up in up in there. So, like, it was, like, a That's cool crazy. thing to kind of... At, I remember when Pharrell came through, that was ill because Pharrell came through and um, this must have been like 2000. And, when did Grindin come out? 2002? I don't know. Never you would know, right? Grindin? What song? Grindin? Grindin. Um, like 2001, 2002? 2002. 2002. Yeah. yeah. I remember the first time I heard Grindin and I played it. I was like, first time I heard it, I seen the video. I was like, holy shit. I just saw something that was like from fucking Mars. I've never heard anything like this mm-hmm. ever in my life. Yeah, you yeah. know, the, the first time you heard grinding, you're like, what the fuck, right? Right. So like, I remember, I remember I'd play this at, at the Remedy on Monday night. And around this time, the crowd would be like, nah, I'm going to hear that shit. Give me something that like, you know, it's got like some Rhodes keys on it or whatever, you know, some, <laughs> some yeah. Mock Chompa yeah. style, yeah. style it's shit. It's definitely shit. different when they came out. Yeah, 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 yeah. So then I remember like when my man Nino brought Pharrell in there, they were on tour for the Sprite Li- Liquid Mix Tour. They were touring with 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 Hova and all the state property dudes and like 311 and shit like that, right? You know, so Pharrell was there <laughs> wow. on a Monday. What an odd combo. Yeah. yeah, it was like one of those, like it was like a, you know, it was like a Lollapalooza kind of extreme, extreme, you know, shit. You know what I'm saying? Um, and uh, so my man Nino brought Pharrell in and like, first of all, like, the nicest fucking dude ever. The nicest, like, was like this, literally the sweetest dude. He was, he was, grinding was already out, so Neptunes were already bubbling, but I think this was like pre, like, Neptunes huge humongousness, right? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, first of all, the nicest dude. Secondly, the biggest fucking diamond encrusted watch I've ever seen in my life. This <laughs> shit was the size of a fucking Cadillac. I remember when he left, he was leaving and the, the stairs of fluid were, would go down to get out of here, right? It was on the second floor, right? And he waved high, waved by to me at the, the booth. And right at that moment, a laser hit his fucking watch. And it was like this explosion of like fucking like cosmic shit. It was the wildest shit in the like world. Like the Death Star blew up. <laughs> like the Death Star blew up. Dead ass, right? You know what I mean? There's a funny thing too, because like the next day I woke up at like seven o'clock in the morning. It was Nino calling me and he was like, yo, Kaz, like Pharrell really loved your set last night. Do you want to open for them at the liquid mix tour. Oh, and I'm shit. like, fuck yeah. I'm like, fuck yeah. And then I realized it was my anniversary with my girl. So I was like, baby, I know it's your anniversary. Like, it's for real. It's, yeah, it's, it's for real. <laughs> and she was like, you, you got this. So like, yeah, so that was dope. It was actually, I played in between Jay-Z and, and I played in between NERD and Jay-Z. Wow. And, um, wow, man. That's and it was, it was Jay- with all it was, it was in Camden, so it was Philly, right? So it was it was Jay with all the straight, state prop dudes. It was free. It was beans, all that shit, right? You know what I'm saying? Wow. And like, you know, I'm playing in front of like twenty five thousand people, and it's just like, what are you gonna do? Just just don't play anywhere. Don't play any state prop records or, or Hove, and don't play any nerd records. But you can play everything else. And literally, it was just like all that shit. And I'm only playing for like twenty minutes or something like that, mm-hmm. and literally just like smashing that shit. It was so ill. Um, God, crazy. that's that's such a great time for Philly, right? That, that Great era time with the Rockefeller Philly, Philly era is just Rockefeller Cassidy Philly. was coming yeah. out. I, I Iverson and Sixers were killing it. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It was it was an ill time. The, the 2000, 2000, early 2000s was like such an ill time for Philly. Dead yeah. ass was crazy. Yeah, it's such a great time. It's such a great time to be at at a concert like that to DJ too, man, and just see all yeah, that yeah, shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, in fucking it was like, Philly. It was, yeah, it was yeah. It was, like, it was like a what's a wonderful thing. So anyway, getting back to the rub. This is kind of the long route of the story. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we were always kind of doing a little shit differently. And then I ended up linking up with Ayers. I, I linked with Eleven first because him and I were on each other's email lists. So we would do, like, we would do gig trades, you know. Mm-hmm. Eleven, come down to Philly and play, play, the, play the joint, you know. Yeah, and then I'd go yeah. up to New York and play a joint with him, right. And, like, I had, like, Eleven play a joint with, in Philly would be, like, with me and Mad Lib and Peanut Butter Wolf and Jazzy Jeff and Quest Love and like, you know, so I'm like, yo, I'm going to put you on this lineup because this is the joint I'm doing, right? And then we were doing smaller shit in New York, but we were we were kind of making that that pop. And then Ayers and I connected too, so we would do the same thing. I'd come down, I, he would 
come down to Philly and play. And then he would be like, yo, come up and play this party. This is before it was called the Rub, right? It was um, it was a birthday party for M- Mikey Palms, who was one of the owners of Southpaw, R.I.P. Southpaw. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so Ayers is like, I'm doing – that was the first – that was the first Rub. And then they thought it was really good. And I don't even think it was 11. I think it was Ayers and Eddie Stats and maybe like a couple other dudes, right? So it was like this rotating thing. And then Ayers is like, yo, coming up and play this party that I'm doing – at Southpaw, and this is like the first year, so like 2002, I guess. Mm-hmm. And um, and I was like, all right, cool. I came up there, it was all vinyl, right? Yeah. And yeah. I'm like, I'm, I'm bringing my, I'm bringing my Philly, you know, swagger. You know what I'm Dance. saying? Yeah. It's like you smell blood. Philly DJs, like you smell blood in the water. You just want to fucking go, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So I'm just like, all right, cool. Like, all right, so I'm bringing my, I smashed it, smashed it. So Eric's just like, oh shit, all right, cool. Hey Cosmo, like yo. You want to come up next month? So I'm like, hey, cool. And by this time, it was just Ayers, 11, and I, three of us, right? You know, so it came up again and smacked, smashed it, right? You know, and then, um, and then I think the one year anniversary of the rub, uh, coincided with me and my my now ex wife, um, moving to Brooklyn because we were like, let's get out of Philly, move to Brooklyn. I kind of hit glass ceiling in Philly, right? You know, it's like let's go to yeah. let's, let's move to Brooklyn, and um, so the one year anniversary of the rub which also coincided with me relocating again to Brooklyn mm-hmm. also uh, coincided with the three of us saying, Hey, listen, we got a good dynamic. The three of us work really well together. The three of us play really well together. You know, this party seems like it's a lot of fun. It may have legs and it was nowhere near to the size it got in the mid to late nineties. Like nowhere, nowhere near, nowhere near. Yeah. It was just a fun party in Brooklyn. Right. And we were having a good time and we we're just like acting a fool and also playing a lot of shit that, you know, you couldn't get or a good, you couldn't get an opportunity to play with mm-hmm. in New York. Like that, all the things I was saying about with like Giuliani and like bottle services and the way that nine eleven had affected uh, a lot of nightclubs in in Manhattan. If it weren't, with, except for like places like APT, right? Mm-hmm. You really couldn't get a, a, away with playing a lot of like kind of cool all shits, which is one of the reasons why you start seeing all this stuff kind of pop up in Brooklyn. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of the hipster shit in Williamsburg, the electro shit, you know, that DFA stuff. But then we were like. I mean, we liked a lot of that stuff, but we were also like hip hop heads. You right. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like all this was kind of like the perfect storm for everything kind of in Brooklyn just kind of exploding in the early 2000s. Yeah. yeah. Which, was, which was when we really kind of kicked it off with the rub. Mm-hmm. It also gave Brooklyn something. I felt like there weren't, oh. you know, like Brooklyn didn't have, I mean, I didn't know about it at the time. I, you know, every all the spots were in Manhattan. And yeah. it was always everyone from Queens Brooklyn, everyone was just like all everyone who had to take a bridge, bridge and tunnel, right? Crowd like yeah, coming yeah. to Manhattan just to go to clubs, and this was the first time there was something local for Brooklyn motherfuckers, and right? Because everybody, everybody wanted to leave Brooklyn. Right, you're living in Brooklyn. There's no, there's no cool. You, there's the bars. There's bars in Brooklyn. There's mm-hmm. bars. You, you, maybe a couple places where you had a little DJ set up with like a, a bar, right? You know yeah. what I'm saying? But it wasn't anything that was like super legit, like dance club mm-hmm. right yeah and like you know definitely definitely uh southpaw was one of the first and also they actually did live live music as well which was big right and they mm-hmm. they, 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 they they killed it but you know it, the rub just became so big that like you know people would call the venue the rub mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying the way that the southerners call soda coke you know yeah. what i'm saying yeah so like I remember a lot of people calling Southpaw the the venue. They call it the Rub, and I was Rub. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember yeah, yeah. that also. Uh, yeah. That's dope. <laughs> That's well, crazy. So, so you was and a lot of people because when they, when I speak to motherfuckers about the Rub, they they think about the motherfucking remix, right? Mm-hmm. Those those compilation. I, I guess you would call them mixtapes at yeah, the time tapes, right? that just had like all of these yeah, mashups. They, it was kind of like the the East Coast voice of the mashups at that time. Yeah, uh, yeah. The Rub. Yeah. And you guys had like mashups from Mark Ronson, Holotronics, which was Diplo, yep. um, and uh, and Lobezy, of course. And I I, I had and something. In there. Yeah, I was in there. <laughs> oh, but you had. Don't forget you had, about you had the crooked. You had a crazy Are we gonna run. talk about that vocal intro on the crooked mix though? <laughs> hey, hey yo B A, hey yo J. <laughs> I think I think we talk about that before, so we just move forward. <laughs> it's, you know, it's funny about that that CD when I was on. Um, I was in Vegas at the time, and that came out, and I was doing like lounges out here. 
that would be like my opening set. I would play that CD for the first hour or so. Oh, really? That yeah. whole thing? Yeah. So I was like, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I'm in there. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I'm all right. <laughs> I'm all right. <laughs> it's kind of we all had we all had that CD. I think mine was Woodman's R&B opener, which was from a uh, turntable app, Woody from turntable app, which was just like the perfect opening set from like an early 2000s perspective. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know what I, I'm saying? I remember hearing so, about uh, Woody. Woody was like that. He was an Asian dude, right? Wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember. Guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember spinning yeah. with him once at Canal Room and stuff. Big shot to yeah, him. Yeah, uh, him and him and Misha uh, uh, would uh. We're, we're doing stuff second cousins i think back when all that turntable app stuff was really popping off right 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 um, it's funny. but you know leave, leave it to airs though i mean that was really you know you, you got to give it to airs because he had well he's always had a really good uh, uh concept of like brand right you know what i'm saying but like mm-hmm. you know it was the idea of kind of like let's get behind and kind of try to encapsulate what these nights were mm-hmm. on a on a mix cd and it wasn't full on mix cd but then it was after kind of seeing the not just the popularity of it, but um, the way that it was useful for DJs because it was becoming really, really, this is right when mashups were really kind of popping up. And we can even talk about that too. Then he was like, all right, we'll, we'll put this out as separated tracks, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, kind of like there's the idea of us becoming this little cottage industry. And that was all airs, man. He was really, really uh, uh, ahead of the game and thinking, okay, we can do this. And that was also one of the things that definitely gave us like international notoriety right because once and this is like the internet was ex- is existing but like you know we're still mailing cds mm-hmm. you feel me and people are still getting cds from you know uptown get money nation you know and go in there and whole thing and it was a process right but it's it funny though it it's, was it's, like you guys were so professional though i mean like the the website the blog you know the, the CD distribution. I remember Eleven was like selling tons of CDs. Eleven, Eleven was like Eleven was like selling so many mix CDs to all these like record stores and skate shops. I mean that was like it was a like huge, Master P. I mean he bro, was, it was bro. a huge it was a huge side business for him. I remember he'd be like doing the rounds and going to record shops and being like, "Yo, you need a re up," and he would just be. Yeah, he was, he was he was all about that. I, did you ever go to his old crib off of like Park Place and Park Slope? Yeah, he yeah. Tiny, he had yeah. a tiny little crib. It was tiny as fucking. Three quarters of the crib was just boxes of CDs. Yeah, you know <laughs> what I'm saying. But understanding that was like super super lucrative, and they ended up being like, I never really approached the CD game because it wasn't really where my heart was, mm-hmm. right? You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying. But like, we definitely were like putting in numbers. Shit, I remember. Eleven and I did the did the all Rick James mix, right? Which yeah. came out around the same time that Chappelle's show joint came out, right? Yeah, it, it and was, um, it was perfect at that time. It was a great mix too. What you guys did, yeah, it was cool. And also, like as a love, as a lifelong Rick James fan, I was just like, "Fuck yeah, Rick James, I'm I'm fucking about it." Mm-hmm. But it was funny mm-hmm. though because I remember being out on the uh, we were out in Eastern Parkway. Maybe it was I was out there. I was on Eastern Parkway for the West Indian Day Parade, Labor Day, right? And I remember walking around. I saw a dude with the blankets. A whole bunch of CDs, and I saw my Rick James CD out there. Oh shit! Was it legit? Was, like, oh. was it bootleg or was, was a it bootleg? <laughs> a bootleg. That's where you like. I, I felt so good. I felt so uh-huh. good. I felt so good because you know that once you've been bootleg, you made it, right? You made you it. That's the Yeah. <laughs> so I was just like, they used to say a bootleg or get your leg broke. I was like, nah, bro, like go for it. You know what I mean? So you didn't even bother yourself and shit. Like I, oh, I did. Me. I did. I, bought it. I, bought it. I think I still have a copy. <laughs> it was all janky ass bootleg. Like it was. Like, I mean, almost as janky as the, you know, a little jankier than the, the ones we actually made because our drums are pretty janky. You know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> now, yeah, yeah, y'all, yeah, y'all shit was really legit, man. I, I was even shocked when you guys, um, when you guys started pressing up the, uh, it's the motherfucking remix, the rub remixes on vinyl. Oh, that's, yeah. that's like the first time I was ever on vinyl. I mean, first and last and ever time I was ever on vinyl. <laughs> but I was like, at that time, I was like, oh shit, I'm actually on vinyl. Like, this is crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, you, that was a, there was the there was the the two vinyl piece. The one was the the club shit, and one was the weird shit. Right? You were on the club shit one yeah. with me. What was it like? My Oshila Cooley Dance Joint, right? Maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And your uh, your uh, O3, uh, it was the O three Bonnie and O3 Clyde Bonnie, and Bonnie Arrested Clyde. Development, yeah, Arrested okay. Development, yeah, yeah. Um, and there was a, a few other joints on there that were like uh, like club appropriate, and then yeah. there was the other joint which was like Diplo and you know like mm-hmm. Ronson, you know, and like 
that was like the weird mashup shit that was just like, all right, yeah, I don't know how much that's going to work in the club, but <laughs> we surprised, we surprised. Some, of, some, of the, some of the, when we actually got to like touring extensively, and it was mostly Ayers and I doing most of the touring, mm-hmm. you know, we would do like, we'd be playing some places and like, man, they wanted to hear that shit, yeah. you know? And it'd be funny because like, you'd be like, you'd be wanting to play in the club. You want to play joints that bang in the club. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And you know, play a new hip hop record, play a new dance record, and like the people would be out there, they wanted us to play like weird shit. Be like, eh, you know how much that works. You know? It's such a that was a weird era because a lot of DJs were playing mashups, but mashups didn't necessarily work in the club all the time. Nah, nah, nah. And, but nah. but it's like they wanted to hear it, and then you you started hearing these DJs that would just. It would kind of be like play regular song, regular song, regular song. For every three regular songs, you could play like one mashup or like one party break. But yeah. then this was like the beginning era where you would just literally hear DJs play mashup, 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 mashup. And, you, and I remember thinking like, yo, this is horrible. This is like, horrible. this is terrible. But it was, yeah. I guess at the time, the only it was the only digital representation, right? That was when, that was the only example that they, that they had of what was going on, but they didn't, they weren't hearing what was going on in the club. No one was recording their sets in the club. So to them, those mashups were a reference to like, Oh, this is what's going on in the clubs in New York. In, 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 the, in their imagination. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and also, I mean, I'll, I'll go as far as to say that like, well, whereas like, we all know like mashup isn't even a real fucking term. It's a blend, right. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And that, like, exactly. shout, to, yeah. shout to Ron G, you know what I'm saying? And, and you know, and that's exactly. like, I mean, come on, you know right, what I'm saying? That's right. what DJs. That's what DJs have been doing since forever. I know all, th- all through the '90s, mm-hmm. do R&B blends and shit like that, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, first of all, it's like this fake. It's this fake thing, right? Yeah. But then, like, it w- became like this arms race to like let's try to put together to put together two of the weirdest things that you could fucking think about, <laughs> and it would just be like put it together <laughs> just for the sake of kind of putting it together. No sense of the musicality, mm-hmm. no sense of if it actually was groovy, no sense of it, sense of it actually had any sort of uh, like club worthiness or even musical worthiness, right? You know what I'm saying? So right. it just ended up becoming like, like it became masturbatory, if anything, right? And 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 furthermore, with the kind of rise, of, I got words, I got I got time. Right? You guys are wordsmith, bro. It's amazing. <laughs> furthermore, with the rise of mashups and the kind of like the, 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 the way that mashups became kind of a, an entryway into the gentrification of both DJing and also black music mm-hmm. by a lot of people who had no connection or vested interest in this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it opened up that. And then also concurrently with the, the advent of digital DJing, which gave people access, it made it so that the floodgates were wide open. So that really ended up becoming, you know this, you've seen this. Right. Any Tom, Dick, and Harry all of a sudden was like, oh, I'm a DJ just because I'm, I'm interested in, I've got a collection of six mashups and I've got a fucking Herb Albert record. You know what I'm saying? I don't know nothing about fucking music or even the way that the mechanics of playing music in front of people work. Mm-hmm. And so all of a sudden, that's when you started to see all these celebrity DJs. And all these people who have no business behind a turntable, you know. Well, I mean, whatever. Business behind it, do what you want. You know what I'm saying? But it started to make it so that it was harder for working class DJs for sure. to really get the jobs. So, like, it was a really, really difficult thing in how that this cool thing and this cool invention of digital DJing had this really unfortunate byproduct. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy because you're such a music nerd like you you like really deep dive into like musical history like it's almost insane like i always look to like uh neva as an idiot savant for like music like literally he knows the years of of he knows the record label of every song that's come out i don't even know how he records that shit or remembers it but you you go on twitter and you go on these deep dives and it's it's insane it's like you go into these deep dives on artists and and it's it's really it's like one of those things where I, I was reading it. And I'm like, this dude needs his own podcast, or he needs some kind of shit, some type of platform <laughs> to like share some of this sh- information that he has. You know? Yeah, my platform is being drunk too late at night and being bored on Twitter and getting. <laughs> <laughs> it's going off on Twitter. That's the podcast. 
<laughs> no, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> the name of the podcast is Too Gone Too Late. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, no, but it's like here's the thing. I mean, there's you know, the the connections there, man. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, you know, nothing is born in a vacuum. Everything that you see out is has a connection to everything that's come before, mm-hmm. right? You know what I'm saying? Whether or not you like it or not, whether or not you acknowledge it or not, you know, it's you know, you listen to this and you listen to you listen to a song by the baby, right? And you can figure out two or three or four steps of how that goes all the way back to little richard right which then goes back to yeah goes back to you know the uh you know the 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 african diaspora in the middle middle passage right you know what i'm saying so you could you could without question start drawing all those narratives and that lineage together but specifically when it comes to um to music and like i just like shit and i like what i like and i like everything i like so much different shit right and and you know i feel I feel indebted to to being in a place where I actually have a space to play music for people, hmm. right? Yeah, and I, I I feel grateful for that, and I feel super grateful for the fact that you know that all of this has kind of come before me, and so I want to pay homage to that. You know what I'm saying? Right. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of people be like, "Oh man, that's old shit." You know what I'm saying? But like, bro, I mean, I, I fuck around with some new shit like to to the days on. I I listen to new music every day. I try to find new shit every day. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's just part of the way that I digest things. So, um, you know, I just, to me, it's the stories behind it all have always been really, really intriguing. And when you know the stories behind it all, it really kind of frames what it is that you're listening to in a, in a different way. And, and, uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I know. Yeah. Have you always had that gratitude for the music and for, for, for the craft of DJing or as you get older, does it kind of all come full circle and do you start to appreciate it? As you like, look look in retrospect of that's your co- of your of your career. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a good question. I mean, I think everybody. I mean, all of us on this on this podcast. I mean, we've all we're all vets, right? You know what I mean? So well, like, besides Jamie, yeah, yeah so I'm, Jamie. I'm, not, I'm, I'm the rookie. <laughs> I'm the rookie. I'm coming up. I don't even know if he's a rookie, but he's you know he's I'm in the rookie. minors. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a prospect. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a high I prospect. I don't even know. I don't even know if he's a prospect. Uh, you're not giving me that bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of here. Oh man. <laughs> I mean, he, no, but Jamie, you're not even like a hot piece of ass delivering vinyl I'm at not, this point. Yeah, you know I'm, I'm not the hot new guy. You know, we're to Cosmo. <laughs> Jamie, Jamie, listen, change your mind, bro. <laughs> Think of yourself as that hot piece of ass, brother. You can do it. You can do it. Here you are, Frankie Knuckles. <laughs> yeah, that was the best story of all time. Oh, man. Oh, oh that's fucking hilarious. Holy shit. Oh, man. Oh. <laughs> Who's this hot new guy delivering the vinyl? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. man. No, I, think, I, I think i think that man you know I, all of us you always kind of think about what it is you, what you what you've done yeah what is it what you, you do who is it that you are mm-hmm. what are the, the things that you've impacted you know without looking back at regrets well like we know, all we all have that regret right where we kind of t- we took we took it for granted because all of us do that in any in any industry in any career I we think, took yep. we took it for granted, and, and maybe we went through. Even I myself went through a self destructive period or, or anything like that. As you get older and you look back, and what really amazes me, and I tell this to Neville all the time, like I'm still amazed that I'm still here DJing. Like mm-hmm. we're still DJing. Yeah. Yep. You know, yeah. like it, I didn't think I didn't twenty twenty five years ago. I didn't think I was like, oh, this this motherfucker is going to be a DJ into his forties. You know what I'm saying? Like. It's just a crazy concept to me, and I really got to be grateful and and thankful to hip hop. You know, if anything, yeah, pretty much, I'm like, yeah. I am completely like my soul is a different person because of hip hop. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Mm-hmm. And yep. yeah, I, I I I talk to a lot of motherfuckers, and I'm like, dude, I would not be here. You know, clothing, fashion, design, DJing, music, whatever, podcast. If yep. it wasn't for hip hop, like it's all related to hip hop, it's all, all related, related to hip hop. Like my friends, yeah. everything, the Why girl, not? the girls I dated, like the the people I I hung out with, how I 
how yep. I approached life in general was thank like thank God for hip hop, yo. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, the 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 way I look at it is because you guys are kind of like the first generation that is growing in this hip hop scene. So there, to me, there's never been a stoppage point where you get to retire. You guys keep pushing the boundaries as the generation before me, you guys keep pushing the boundaries more and more and more jazzy Jeff, older and older. Mm -hmm. So there's no stoppage maybe because you guys seen basketball players or whatever, kind of call it a day at 38, 39. You guys are like, well, what am I still DJing here? when basketball players, these pro athletes are retiring at an early age, 38, 36. So you guys don't have, there hasn't been no stoppage. So if you guys keep going, the generation behind you, which is mine or whatever, it just keeps, we keep seeing the, you guys just break barriers as it goes up. Mm -hmm. So that's how we look at it. I mean, my generation looks at it because we've never, you guys are all we looked up to. So you guys keep breaking that barrier and just keep breaking the, the ceiling. It's, there's no stoppage. Well, I, I think that's a really good point there though. You know, I mean, Part of it is is that like all of us are are kind of creating our world as we go along, right? We're just making it yeah. up as we go along anyway, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, and Kruka, to your point, you know, you were talking about fashion, you know, design, all this stuff, all this stuff from hip hop, right? You know, and I'm like, word. And I think about myself, case in point, I'm just a dude from South Philly, right? You know, that you know, like because of DJing and because of hip hop, I traveled the traveled the globe, traveled the globe. Yeah, been, I've been everywhere, man. You know what I'm saying? I've been, you know what I mean? It's nuts. I've bought houses. I've supported myself. I've entertained mad people. But I've also gotten this this sense of fulfillment mm -hmm. and being being part of something, having the, the having the grace to be part of something, mm -hmm. having been given that allocation. You feel me? And, you know, to me, it goes beyond anything which is uh, material. Right. You know, it's something which it's something which is very much uh, uh, intangible. Uh, and yeah. so talking about like that gratitude. Right. Yeah. And, you know, within, I think, specifically uh, the, the world of the DJ world. Right. You know, I mean, it's all very tribal, too. Right. How all of us really have had looked out for each other in the sense of it as being like a greater community. And you've seen that and you still see that, you know, with people who are your contemporaries and then you get put on by somebody who's, you know, maybe been on for a little bit longer and then how you can put somebody else on as well. Um, and it becomes this, this cycle of just kind of giving back and giving back and giving back. So, um, you know, that said to me, I don't ever think it's going to be something that, is going to change for me in the sense of my love of being a, a DJ. Mm -hmm. You know, I, if I, it just happened that I was able to make a, a, a career out of something, which was a passion that became a hobby and then became a career. If I was working at a bank or if I was selling fucking newspapers at the bottom of a bridge, I'd still would be DJing on my free time. Right. I would still be in the music. I still be about all that shit. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But the other cool thing is that like, it's been being a DJ and having to learn how to navigate the business, having done it, basically running yourself as a small business for it's been 30 years at this point, right? Mm -hmm. You, in a real time sense, you have to learn, you, you accumulate all the business acumen with all sorts of different types of, of tools and skill sets that could then allow you to, I mean, I've done a whole bunch of different types of entrepreneurial stuff. Um, I still do all that stuff to this day, which is a lot of it has nothing to do with DJ, mm -hmm. but it's DJing that got me here. And it's DJing that put together the skill sets that allows me to do create a consultation for, you know, art museums and, and all sorts of the weird shit that I do, right. which I don't, I don't talk about on Twitter because it's got nothing to do with anything. <laughs> so like, yeah. So like, you know, I'm just, again, I'm just grateful. I'm just grateful to be here, bro. You know what I'm saying? And it's and I'm grateful for the music. I'm grateful for hip for hip hop and and for us to have been able to kind of you know kind of give, keep on giving back. So how, that's how do you feel about what's going on right now? With I mean, obviously with COVID nineteen, with the the state of the country right now, oof. you know, no, no venues open. You know, oof. and I know you've been streaming, and I I can see that you're really loving it. You've been enjoying it. You're enthusiastic about streaming. Um. 
I, I want to know. I want to pick your brain on like pause on like how do you feel like you you've been in this industry thirty years, you know we've never really witnessed anything like this before. It's yeah. like a it's like a reset of everything, right? It's the reset yeah. of the industry. How do you think everything's going to emerge in the next three to five years? You know what? What's your thinking? Why? I, I just wanted to just throw something out there on what you think is going to happen. You know, I've given it some thought, right? You know what I'm saying? I think all of us in this position have have had to give it thought. You know, we've been compelled. I mean, so many of us have seen our uh, maybe not necessarily our main income or what ancillary income, whatever, you kind of get decimated. Yeah. Right. You know what I'm saying? Some people I know are straight out of work. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and that's not even talking about DJs. I mean, there's anybody within the hospitality industry, you know, bartenders, uh, servers, uh, uh, people in the restaurant industry. Restaurant industry is fucked. Mm-hmm. It's so bad. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I think that a lot of people, specifically DJs and me kind of thinking about this, right, having been compelled to think about it, there's a few things that I think about. So, first of all, streaming is fun. Streaming does... It's, it's its own thing. It does not replicate the actual feeling of being within a room with yeah. live bodies, right? Right. There's a, there's a very human, inherent human need, which is communication. There's also a very in, inherent human need, which is congregation. Humans need to be around other people. Mm-hmm. We're not wired. We're not wired to not be, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. All the Zoom, all the streaming, yeah. it's fun. It's fun as shit. It's cool as fuck. But it's not, it does not replicate that. Right. So that said, nevertheless, streaming is here to stay. It's absolutely here to stay. And it is going to replace a lot of people's need and want for going out. For the way that things are going to reopen, uh, it's also going to be not just on the government and whatever happens with the election right now, because Lord knows that's going to mean a lot of shit. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. How the states run things how individual businesses run things, but so much of it is also going to be about just the consumer. And is the consumer going to be confident? When is their confidence going to come back? I did a, I've been doing, I've been doing a few outdoor distance gigs, right? On like a rooftop here. I'm doing something on a truck tomorrow. Right. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Um, Yeah. It's wild. Me and and Muhammad D are doing something for, uh, for, uh, we're, we're, we're we're pulling up in an early voting, but, polling place right while mm-hmm. people are online right and then we're going to do a quick 20 minute impromptu performance me and bahamadi just to kind of oh, get wow, people man. jazzed up about the like, voting right you know what i'm saying i love that i love that you're you you and bahamadi are working together this is you know that's yeah, yeah, yeah. that's some true philly shit right there yeah, yeah. <laughs> well that's my she's my homie from like from a long time ago you know what i'm saying so like you know always like the type of thing if you see you see cool shit to do they like, always put your homies on right but um back to like covid right like I've, I've done a couple outdoor gigs and you could tell the people who are even going out, mm-hmm. at least in my experience, the people who are going out, their mind is not right. Their mind's not there yet. They're not there yet. They want to be there, but when they're there, actually there in the physical space, the angst and the anxiety is just kind of wafting off of them. Mm. So the consumer confidence is going to be something that's going to be the last hurdle other than vaccinations or cures or whatever that's going to be a big thing and a lot of the people might not ever want to come back and a lot of these nightclubs are not going to come back Mm. and so the the market's going to shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink right the international touring dj circuit that's never going to be the same again if if it's even going to exist so what do i think what is going to happen i don't know man this is such a strange time it's such a strange thing. We're all kind of like dealing with the uncertainty of everything. And the unknown is one of the things that's fucking people's heads up more so than anything, right? Right. But if I had to speculate of what I think, how it may look after all this is said and done, mm-hmm. I think that there will be a weird hybrid of some sort of generalized streaming entertainment which will not just be DJs, but will be kind of streaming entertainment, which will also be interactive, right? And I'm sure that a lot of the content companies are already looking at this, right? You know what I'm saying? I'm sure your Spotify's and your Apple's are already looking at this, right? So an amalgamation of like a Spotify, a Twitch, and a and a and a YouTube, right? Some sort of hybrid of all that, right? Right. And um, and then also I think that for I think live is still gonna 
exist. Mm -hmm. I just think it's going to become really localized. I think that you're going to get a lot more like local scenes, a lot more underground scenes. I think that these are going to become really strong. They're just not going to be massive. You know, mm -hmm. it's not going to be, it's not going to be EC anymore. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be a lot of little small shit. It's going to be more like, um, it'll be like, you know, nowadays the place in Brooklyn, right? More like a nowadays, which is like a, a outdoor club and a co it's an outdoor club and a co-op and like they do like cooking classes and you know and it's all like a membership thing right and it's yeah. cool right it'll be more it'll be like a do-over thing you know what I'm saying where it'll be like you know kind of like smaller but way more intimate you know Interesting. I think I don't know that's if we survive the year. <laughs> <laughs> Knock on wood. Yeah. They could take us all out right now, man. Yeah, uh, right? But he is over with, right? <laughs> Fucking oh. giant asteroid for, for president. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> right on November second, supposedly he's supposed to land. I, I have so a I have a similar I have a similar theory that's similar to yours. Uh where I do think that streaming is becoming the new interactive radio. Yeah. And I think it's becoming a new mm -hmm. version of radio. Yeah. I've never been into DJing on radio. Or being mm -hmm. a radio DJ. So when I stream, I don't have that connection to wanting to stream as other DJs. I, I really got into DJing for crowd control and and the party element of that. Controlling yeah. the room and bringing energy to a room. That's yeah. really why I became... In, that's, why, that's really what I became a DJ for. Obviously yeah. the love of music and all of these other things, but... The act of DJing is really about crowd control and reading a room and bringing energy. You know, making you know three three people dance, then ten people dance, and then you know just killing it no matter what. Streaming is is like radio to me. It's like DJing on the radio or DJing at home, and I was never interested in that shit at all. You know, um, but I understand it. So to me, it to me, it's a new form of radio. It's like a modern radio that's interactive and there's a visual. Yep. And um, I think the live element is just going to go through a reset process where we're already seeing what people want to hear in clubs or what people want to hear in clubs in two to three years is going to change dramatically. And mm -hmm. I think the music industry hasn't figured out exactly what the people want. And I think no. we see that this year with how mm -hmm. the artists are dropping the music. They don't know what to drop. They don't yep. know how to actually be quote unquote artists yep. and find their own voice. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Where, and yeah. I think that's, I think this is, I think the next two to three years is going to be really about the change in music the, yep. the, and how artists approach music. Yep. Because mm -hmm. absolutely they can't drop these like shallow, you know, like uh, superficial songs anymore. It just doesn't seem relevant to me. Like it's not hitting to me. It may hit certain audiences, of course. It might it might do really well, but it's like you know, even this new Ty Dolla Sign that dropped. It's an amazing sonically. It's a masterpiece. Like yeah, it's, it's an amazing. It's an amazing. It's well put together. It's a great yeah. album, but there's like no substance in there. You yeah. know, yeah. and, and mm -hmm. it's and it's it's one of those things where I'm thinking. I'm like, wow, like. Imagine if Ty Dolla Sign did this album with J. Cole. J. Cole would bring like this conceptualism to he would just conceptualize every song and and bring all the substance to that to that material. Uh, yeah, but I would it, it, it seems like a real missed opp opportunity. Yeah, really it's a, because it's sonically so great. And then yep. mm -hmm. I'm hearing songs that just sound like, you know, I got an Asian freak. I got a this freak. Anyways, I'm like, we're in 2020 and this is what we're dropping right now. Like, For real. And, and the music is so good. It's like sonically, I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. Yeah, well, he's, a, he's such an incredible musician. He's, it's insane. It's a little yeah. yeah. But I mm -hmm. think it's one of those things where it's just like, you know, they're doing things that, that was working before and it, it's got to change. There's got to be, every, every artist has got to dig a little bit deeper. And you see certain artists that have dug a little deeper and they're doing really well. Like little mm -hmm. baby is one of them. You know, he surprised me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, even mm -hmm. the baby is surprising me. The his his mm -hmm. just the way he's just freaking every feature right now. Mm -hmm. He's just bodying every feature from Afrobeats mm -hmm. to, 
you know, from the yep. Jack Harlow to everything. Even to the new Kanye shit that he's yeah. going to come out on. Yeah, he yeah. sounds uh, amazing in that Kanye shit. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, I, I, mean, I haven't heard that new, new oh, I'm not, I don't check for Kanye. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no, uh, not, 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 I'm with you, Cosmo, but I'm kind of giving him a second chance because the music does sound pretty good. Well, I'm so, always going to give him one listen. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Everybody always say that. They're going to give him a Just so to say that I heard it, right? You know what I'm saying? But, but you got to, you, you know what? I noticed I was listening to his his uh, latest stuff on the phone, but once you, you have to kind of have the speaker surround system just for you to feel the same energy that the song wants to give you. So yeah. listen to it in the car, if you may. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah, I will. I will for sure. But yeah. but but you know but just to the to to Crocker's point, I mean, I actually absolutely feel as if over the next few years, two three years, and right now, like we're all we're all we're we're, we're trying to figure it out, right? right? We're searching for something, right? Mm -hmm. We know that things are changing. Things are changing very very quickly yeah. and changing really drastically across the board because all these industries also impact each other. Right. Yeah, they do. And they the do. social fiber of what it is that we're we're living through here in the United States, the United States alone, I ain't talking about globally, you know, is is changing also so quickly into in real time response to collective trauma. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, that you know, it's changing everything. It's changing everything. So I think that's a really apt observation in the sense of how the music industry is reacting. Because the music industry has traditionally always been on that bullshit, and they're they're displaying it even more so tenfold of just how fucking clueless they are. Yeah, they're fucking clue. They're the industry is the majors are fucking clueless. Mm -hmm. They're it, clueless with the with the with the digital right takedowns. They're fucking clueless. They could have been monetizing off of all the streaming shit. But they're scared. Yeah. They're, they're just they're really scared. scared. They're, they're scared. scared because they're, they, scared. they're not there's no revenue coming in from tour from the artists touring right mm -hmm. and they're realizing the streaming platform the, as the streaming shit that they've that they're that's like everywhere right now they're not making enough money from it you know and mm -hmm. they could they're fucking they're, they're giving up a dollar to save 10 cents mm -hmm. is exactly what they're fucking doing i like that but it's nah. it's weird <laughs> yeah. because it's I like, like that statement. And they're attacking the late uh the record pools now and there's there's obviously no communication between the DJs and these labels. They mm -hmm. don't they don't understand how vital the DJs are in pushing their music and and uh you know educating these crowds on on new artists and shit. It's really mm -hmm. it's kind of sad. I you know and I don't know how you feel but I've been talking with DJ City and Beat Source Mm -hmm. And and they're just like these labels. They don't know shit. They don't even know. They're like, well, why do you guys need acapellas? You know, yeah. well, why do you guys need extended intros? Why do you? Need, they don't even know why. They don't. They don't know anything about what's going on with DJs. Completely clueless. I would. I was shout out to Styles Davis, um, who um, you know from DJ City and Beat Source, and when he gave me the uh, he gave me the crash course on um, he gave me the crash course on a uh, on a uh, Beat Source. Yeah, yeah. Which is this amazing service? It's right. an amazing service, and it's completely in conjunction with with and with full uh, uh, you know full blessings and legal agreement with all majors and whatnot. And to to, to tell me how they still have to make their own eight bar edits, because mm -hmm. yeah. they won't because the labels won't do it right. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's this whole thing of it's it's this willful blindness where the labels just want to keep their their blinders on and look at a model which is outdated, they want to look at the 1998 model. They yeah. still want to look at the model which is pre-digital. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And they they're and they're they're greedy. They're let's just call it like it is. They're greedy and they've been eating fucking high off the hog for, for for mad long, forcing artists who can't sell records anymore into shitty 360 deals. Mm -hmm. You know, forcing them to hit the road. You know, forcing them to you know come out with three albums a year just to break even, which is not how creating art works. Right. You know what I'm saying? So first of all, the major labels and the labels, they can go fuck themselves. <laughs> right. Yeah. Pardon my language, but they can go fuck themselves. Unless you want to give me a deal for a recording 
artist, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? A, a three sixty. Then I'd be like, like Warner Brothers, we're, we're good, though. We're good, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Sony, um, why not? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, right? You know what I mean? But, um, yeah, but first of all, they can fuck themselves. And, you know, if they end up fucking digging their own graves, well, then so be it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because, because the innovators are going to be the people who create what the, the new realm is going to be. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be through whatever this amalgamation of streaming and, you know, individual uh, content generation, content creation and dissemination through that, you know, mm-hmm. it'll be something like that. Mm-hmm. Either that or, um, you know, we'll all just kind of go back to like a, Sitting around a bonfire, you know, banging on fucking sticks and shit, playing you know? <laughs> <laughs> fucking little ukuleles and shit. You know what I'm saying? Hey, yo, <laughs> hey, yo, Kaz, how come you never moved to the West Coast? I feel oh, like I, I feel like you would have done really well on the West Coast. I think you would have excelled yeah. out here, bro. Yeah, well, I always wanted to move to the West Coast, even back when I was a kid. I'm yeah. gonna tell you this when the kid, because like. I tell you what, first time I heard "Bizarre Ride to the Far Side," I was thinking to myself, "Oh my god." These L.A. cats are so dope. I wish I was hanging out with them. I wish these were like my buddies, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then, um, and then, um, and then, uh, so on and so forth and whatnot. I've always had mad love for the West Coast, uh, particularly L- L.A., but mad love to the Bay all over, right? You know what I'm saying? And um, mm-hmm. and then um, in 2008, I remember uh, I got called up. I got called up from the miners to play this little party in – in West Hollywood, it's a place called Crane's Hollywood Tavern. Yeah. It's called the, du- called the Do-Over. Right. And um, mm-hmm. and it was Jamie and Chris and uh, Aloe Black, and one of the guys hit me up, said, come on up, play. And it was the first time I've, I'd played in L.A., first time. No, I'd played in L.A. a few times before, but it was the first time I played a Do-Over. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was funny, too, because I did, I did back-to-back. I played Do-Over during the day with, like, Newmark, no more. Flying yeah. Lotus, maybe. Oh, sure. Damn. And then, and then at night, I played uh, LEX. Banana Split. Nah. Banana Split, which um, it was terrible because it was actually two weeks after Adam's AM's plane crash, so he didn't he didn't play. Mm. He was still getting better, but it was me, uh, Steve Aoki, Fashion played, uh-huh. um, and Mastercraft played. I think right. Anyway, wow. so I did I did the I did the one two. Um, but as to LA, you know, I moved to Portland in 2012 oh, really? for like, mm-hmm. for like six months. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I was going to, wanted to try the West coast out for a little bit of time. I knew the Bay was too expensive. LA, first of all, I needed a car and I didn't have one. B, I was not fully ready to accept leaving the east coast yeah and I, and I knew that look i got east coast tattooed on my arms i mean it's kind of a thing man you know what i'm saying but um but uh i knew that if i had moved to la on like a temporary trial basis right mm-hmm. i'd have blinked my eyes and 25 years would have passed mm-hmm. right you know what i'm saying i yeah. just knew that dead ass right so i tried portland for a little bit and you know i i was it was uh yeah i, I lasted six months <laughs> i lasted like six it. months i was like yeah yeah, shout, out to, shout out to the homies in Portland, though. You know, what I'm saying a lot of homies out there. But um, yeah. But but yeah, I mean, but I've I've I love LA and I love going out there all the time. And you know, I mean, especially kind of with my relationship with Jamie and Chris and the Do Over, and all the homies out there in Cali. You know, Mike B, uh, Morse Code, J Rock. You know, whole, all the B Junkies, homies. You know, what I'm saying and. You know, it's just like I would always do feel as if they're like, A, it's like a second home for me mm-hmm. out, in, out in LA. Mm-hmm. And then also, like, musically and the way I play, I definitely feel at home there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You were one of the first uh, people to, like, come to Vegas to DJ. You were doing Babies, which was hard yeah. rock. Which was oh, a yeah. hard rock. Yeah. Yeah. What, what it was, was it? Body English, right? It, it was Body it, English. Body English. Body English, but, body English but you came during Babies. Uh, like early, early on, I think you were 99. one of the first East Coast motherfuckers 99. they brought to I Vegas. I think I was. Yeah, it was ninety nine and it was two thousand. It's funny because Rob, the guy who owns Den of Thieves, the the club I was DJing with in in at a, in New York nineties, yeah. yeah. so he loves Vegas. So he would go out there, and and um, somebody 
who was at Den of Thieves listen, was listening to Rob DJ and said, hey, listen, we're opening up this club in, in the Hard Rock in Las Vegas. You want to come out and DJ? Rob was like, yeah, cool, just to get out to Vegas. So he was like, fucking word up. Mm-hmm. So he went out there and he did his thing, right? And they were like, we love you. You want to recommend some other people, all right? And then Rob was just like, yeah, you should check out my man Cosmo. Mm-hmm. Um, I just was going by DJ Cosmo. It wasn't Cosmo Baker at the time, right? Um, so it was Babies, which was the brand new club at Hard Rock Hotel, which was relatively new as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, Keith McNally was the owner. He's like one of the guys who was behind Morton Steakhouse, maybe, or he's got some sort of thing like that, right? Anyway, big multi mega business conglomerate dude, right? Mm-hmm. So they brought me out there. And like it was, you fly out there and you play a Saturday, you play a set, you play Friday night, you play Saturday night, and you play. It was eleven to five, right? So six hour sets, right? You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And again, it was just like all it's all vinyl, right? And right. so I'm mm-hmm. schlepping fucking vinyl. So I went out there and they were like, "Oh, yo, that was great! Like, yo, you want to come back in a month?" And I was like, "Yeah, cool." So they brought me back in a month, and then. It was like different management at that time. You know, it was a new club. They're still trying to get their shit together, right? You know? Mm-hmm. So then they were like, oh, yeah, that's great. Like, you want to come back in two weeks? And I'm like, yeah, cool. <laughs> so by the time I came back the third time, the guys who were like, the, the, it was this guy, Ryan and Ryan and Rich, maybe. And they were, bar, they were dead-ass barbacks the first night I was there. And by the time, the third or fourth time I was brought back, yeah. they were like, either managers or like ready to go. And they were young too, like young cats. And they were like, yo, listen, we love you. We're just going to fly you out here every week. You fly out every Thursday. You spend Friday, you spend Saturday, and then you go back on Sunday. Right. And they were like paying me. Wasn't that much. It wasn't that much. Like, I think it was like 600 bucks a week. Wow. It was $300. Oh, okay. It was like nothing, you know, but still like 24. I'm like, yeah, cool. And I'm on in Vegas every week. So that's like nuts. Right. You know, um, (laughs) But it was nuts because, like, it was cool because, yeah, I did that for, like, almost two years, right? Really? And I would fly out. You did that I for two wow. years? Yeah, I would fly out every, I would fly out every week, Holy and I would do it. And, like, me, you know how I, how, you know I get down, right, man? I want to, I'm playing house, and, yeah. like, most every place in Vegas that I would go to around that time was 99.9% of it was dance music, right? Yeah. But it wasn't really house music. It was more like trance it was more like trance and techno, right? It was the rude sandstorm type shit, right? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, on, uh, or the launch, that song, The Launch. I don't know if you remember that one, right? Yeah. Um, but that so, but that was like the West Coast dance music at that time. Was, they they weren't popping on that house shit in, in, in no, the East Coast, no, you know? Weren't. And the no, Midwest and shit, yeah. Yeah, they had like, like trance and right. like funky break type shit, you yeah. know what I'm saying? You know? Like the um, build up shit. With the build up shit, right? You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, then the, and then the the, the little hip hop stuff that was happening in Vegas was like it was like Warren Peace was doing stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And um and uh I think five. Five I think five was five was there, right? Five was yeah, there. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, So I think five I think five and Warren Peace were the only dudes that I knew that were like doing hip hop, right? Um so they would have me at this place, babies, and I would be like Oh shit! Okay, here I am playing in front of, you know, babies just turning to body English. So what? What held held like what? Fifteen hundred people, maybe. Maybe yeah. Then, yeah. So it's a, it was a big, big, big club, right? Yeah. And so like I had to do six hours, and these are people from all over the fucking globe. Oh, yeah. And they were different people every week. It ended up being it's not the same people because it's people there who are on vacation, right? Now a lot of the Vegas locals started finding out that like it became hip. So a lot of the locals were starting to come through as well, you Mm -hmm. know, but still I had this responsibility to play to this transient crowd. Mm -hmm. So I had to like play hip hop and I had to play house music. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I would be like, Oh shit, I need to play hip hop. So like it was a real exercise in like open format. Right. right? And then like, I'm going to play some disco because I like to fuck it. I like to get weird. Right. You know what I'm saying? Or like, so I was like definitely on some like, let's make this as open format as possible. Um, And also like the other thing was, yeah, people coming from across the the country in the United States. So like, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm an East coaster. I'm a Philly dude, you know, New York, Philly roots and whatnot, you know what I'm saying? But 
there are people there from fucking Tallahassee. There are people there from, from Memphis, right? So I mm-hmm. had to like, oh, I need to really buckle down and learn all like this like regional shit, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like think about like out of my entire my entire span of D- DJ in there, like I don't think there was a bigger record bigger than JT Money. Uh I yeah 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 who that who that who that who that who that who that there's like nothing there's like no not one record bigger than that record. Um uh, yeah, that's yeah. Right. <laughs> Good, fucking great tune, big tune, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um yeah, so like yeah, so that was like that was um that was my time in Vegas and that was like around the time when AM was like him and I reconnected and he was with Crazy Town, I think, at the time. Mm-hmm. So this yeah. is pre this is pre like AM Butterfly. Explosion. This is yeah. big A, big AM, right? He was, still big. he was yeah. still big. Yeah. Yes, he was big. Well, he had always been big anyway, so he was like normal. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Skinny yeah. AM's a weird one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I had a question for you, Cosmo. After leaving the rub, did you ever? Why didn't you, I, you never did anything else like another party, another scene, another group? You never decided to get back into that. Not really, man. I mean, the thing about it was like you know, I think by the time I I I left the rub, um. You know, and that had that was coinciding with the ten year anniversary, right? Yeah. And like, so it coincided with ten year anniversary. It coincided with the rub ending mm-hmm. for a little bit of time because Southpaw closed, and also it coincided with me. It was around the time I moved to Portland. I was mentioning that, right? You know what I'm yeah. saying? Mm-hmm. And then I eventually moved back to Philadelphia. So all those things happening, and also like. You know, you're in a relationship for 10 years, you know, relationships change and, you know, sometimes contention comes in and, you know, and dysfunction always creeps in and whatnot, you know. And so it was a decision that I I made. I was like, all right, cool. We can kind of kind of go back into this. But I had done that for 10 years. You know what I'm saying? And it was really time for me to kind of move on and, and you know, kind of do the solo thing, right? Mm-hmm. You know yeah. so, so in doing that... It was. It kind of freed me up from the group dynamic, uh, and allowed me to really kind of explore things in the sense of my solo career. Mm-hmm. I ended up doing a shit ton of more traveling. I ended up getting booked. Like it definitely kind of heightened my profile in my career to be able to not have like those those confines. You know what we did with the rub over the course of a decade was really really special and really really crucial. And you know I would not have the career that I have today, nor would I be the DJ or person that I am today were not for what it is that we built. And I think about it too as well, because I mean, it's almost a decade removed from having not been part of the rub anymore. Mm -hmm. And so like there's, there are a tremendous amount of people who just know me from other stuff. I mean, like to be frank, like once I was no longer part of the rub, and then I ended up fucking with the do over really heavy. I've ended up fucking with three style really heavy, mm-hmm. you know, and was able to kind of really kind of get in and, you know, those being two of the bigger organizations or kind of clicks that I still kind of belong to, you know, but just as much as there's a lot of people who I've made have been showing up on their radar sometime within the past several years and have, they have no idea mm-hmm. about my decade with the rub or even all this other shit that I did before. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, to this day, when people are like, oh, yeah, like, such and such, like, Cosmo, The Rub, blah, blah, blah. I always hear that, and I'm just like, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I feel I feel proud of what it is that we did during that during that 10 years. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, you know, they're still, well, at least before pre-COVID, they were still killing it at Bell House. Yep. You yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's taken on a life of its own. It's changed. It's become different. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the fact that they've been able to run it going, what, 17 years? 18 years? 18, right? Something yeah. like that? Mm-hmm. 18. How long, did, 18 this year. how long did Paradise Garage run for? Joe, I don't a couple of years. How many? It was a couple of years. It wasn't that long. It was like maybe, maybe four or five years, something like right. that. Right. How long? How long did the hacienda run for? It, you know, in in UK, right? Mm-hmm. That's so enough. My, yeah, like two years or so. <laughs> my point is, is that with all these legendary parties and these legendary nightclubs and whatnot, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's it's a hell of a testament to, and it's a hell of a feat to have that longevity. 
Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and yeah. So it's like, and I think that all of us, all of us really should be able to kind of have that self recognition and give ourselves that depth to say, like, shit, man, you know, we understand that the market sometimes changes. Sometimes it's feast for famine. Sometimes it's harder. Sometimes you get a little cranky. Sometimes you say, oh, man, why am I doing this? What? You know, like, Man, I should have gone into banking, you know what I'm saying? Or like whatever, you know what I'm saying? But like but, everybody but, thought the banking shit. <laughs> right, you know what I'm saying? But 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 fuck it, bro. I've been able to do this for 30 years. You know what I'm saying? That's right. And it's yeah. and it's fucking amazing to me that I've been able to actually do it and still stay somewhat relevant. Yeah. And also still yeah. have it fun to me. I still enjoy it. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So like Jamie, to answer your question, um, yeah, you know, after that, I've been pretty much just kind of doing my thing. I did other, I've done other like entrepreneurial shit as well. I opened up the school. I've done a lot of art shit. I've done a lot of business shit. You know, um, mostly I would say probably the the closest that you would say of like the crew is is like the do over, probably. Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Because Jamie and Chris are like my best buds, and you know, and and all the 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 core DJs that are always playing on them and traveling the globe and. You know, never getting old. It's like Peter Pan syndrome and shit. You know, Peter Pan syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> no, they always say baby face, baby face killer Peter Pan. Baby, over they, here. they always said that. I think Haycock said that. Um, that the the that the do over is kind of like the the either hip hop Grateful Dead because of the traveling aspect, or oh, yeah. like you seen like you seen the movie Point Break, right? Mm-hmm. So it's those guys, they just do their thing just so they can follow the summer. They rob banks just so they can follow the summer all around the globe and keep on surfing. And that's like the do-over. At least while we could still travel, we just keep on doing parties around the globe, around places that are beautiful. Oh, it's January in Philadelphia? Let's go to fucking Rio de Janeiro. You know what I'm saying? Oh, it's like, you know, like, let's just do it. You know what I'm saying? So like. That's like the cool thing about the do-over. And like, yeah. And like, also shout out to everybody. Shout out, shout out to all the homies, you know. And yeah, I, I feel like there's a bunch of younger DJs who are coming up that, you know, are learning about you. And I, I recently saw, like, in the past year or two, a lot of these younger DJs are, are looking up to you. And they, they've been tweeting at you. And uh, it, I think it's a great thing that, you know, you said uh, you're somewhat still relevant, but you definitely are relevant, you know. And uh, you're, you're a lot of these younger dudes and up-and-coming DJs, they're definitely looking at you. And I know they're they're getting so geeked off of your stream and what you're playing and and uh, your enthusiasm hasn't changed in the past 20 years that I've known you when you DJ, you know? It's still there. And I think that's a really important part about you, that uh, that you always had that enthusiasm for the music, even when you're playing it, you know what I mean? I remember, yeah. I even remember doing the rub a couple of times, and every time the energy would get really kind of crazy, you were like the dude that's always like, yo, yo, let me, I, I got some, let me get on, let me get on, let me get on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, I was like, like, me, and I'm like, break the ceiling. I know Cosmo's always the dude. He's like, oh no, no, that's like it's it's getting good, but I'm gonna take it over here. And I'm like, we're like, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yo, my, yo, my bad, crooked, yo, no, 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 let me drive the boat. Let me drive the boat. It's, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's Let's funny. It, I, I loved it. It was just one of those things where we would like break balls, but at the time, I'm like, this dude loves loves this shit. You know what I mean? He really loves the shit. And it, I, yeah. I do. Man. Yeah. It's funny because, like, much love and, and rest in peace to homie uh, Blue Gems, yeah. James Blue Gems. You know, um, he always used to call me Showtime. Showtime. And I was like, Showtime. Showtime. That's a perfect name. <laughs> and, I was, and I was just like, "What do you mean?" He's just like, "He's and, and you know, James. Yeah, man, I tell you, you call you Showtime. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, all right, you're James. What you mean? Like, oh man, because you know when Cosmo Baker comes on, that's Showtime. You know. <laughs> so like, oh, yeah, yeah. it's funny, but um. No, I, I love it, man, and I love that I love I love that I'm able to do this, and I'm love to be able to like do weird shit, like fucking share disco records with kids who were born 20 years after the record were, was existed yeah. was recorded, and like the kids will be like, oh, this shit is dope, you know. But like, you know, to the point of like, you you know that you know that saying like, um, uh, you know, we we didn't inherit the earth from our parents; we are borrowing the earth from our children mm. in the sense of like being protective of the climate. Right. And how right, we right, right. To, 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 to treat the earth. Right. You can even flip that a little bit and say that we didn't inherit, we didn't inherit the culture from those that came before us, rather that we are borrowing it from those who are coming after. Mm. Right. Yeah. You know? 
So what it is that we're doing with the culture is kind of setting up the setting up the lob for the or tennis, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or baseball, the setting serve. up the lob, boom, setting up the serve, yeah, yeah, setting up the serve for the next generation to to get it and run with it because they're gonna run with it. Right, their youth always wins. Mm-hmm. The, the young, the youth, the kids always win. You know, mm-hmm. that's just that's just the dynamic, right? So, you know, the idea of actually being able to serve it over to them, but serve it over them correctly, serve them within context, serve it to them with the, you know, the idea that they also see that they have a sense of ownership of it is oh, really yeah. important. You know what I'm saying? And like, you know, if you think about the way that the, 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 the entry point and the access point to a lot of this was always so close for so, so long, right? You know what I'm saying? You know, and you see that opening up and you see that there's a lot more people that are a lot more inclusive uh, and uh, allowing not just different types of people, but different types of sounds and different ideas. And, you know, the shit that the kids are doing these days, I sound like Grandpa Simpson, that shit that the kids are doing these days. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but you know what I'm saying, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah. it's, it's fucking amazing. It's, and I get yeah. just as much, I just get just as much uh, 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 inspiration from like what the young DJs and producers are doing just as much as I do watching legends like DJ Scratch and you know and 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 you know and whomever Jazzy Jeff right That's you know like shout out to Rebel Foster young kid from Philly he just sent me up this this beat that he did which is like a flip of uh, Jigga what Jigga who but like yeah. a dance beat you know what I'm saying and it's fire it's fire you know so like what a lot of these young kids these one these young DJs and producers who are taking all that stuff and they're putting their own flip on it yeah. because because it's their it's their perception yeah. you know it's coming from a 2020 perception of a young black kid who's 19 years old you know what i'm saying who's going to make some shit that's going to fuck everybody up mm-hmm. you know yeah. what i'm saying mm-hmm. so I, I hold out to the youth and if i have an a, 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 the privilege and the honor to be in a position for them to look up to or them to say like hey listen and I could pass down some jewels, then then my work is done. Nice. Nice. Yo, Kaz, thanks for coming yeah, through, man. Thanks for coming on the podcast, man. Dropping some oh, jams, per- Perfect note, yeah. per- perfect way to end perfect the podcast, ending. man. Yeah. What up? <laughs> um, Fuck. What do you call it? Right before we end this though, and thank you for coming through and, and coming on the on the on the road shit. Um, I gotta ask you about salt. Yeah. Because I got put on to salt through you on Twitter. Yeah. What do you? What is this? What is this group? What do you know about this group? How did you know about? Do you know who's in it? I don't. Yeah. Yeah, you do. You. Yeah. This is. You got to know. This is an amazing group, and they've just they've been consistently dropping music for the past two years or four, four, four albums, four? Eight, four years, four albums in eighteen months. Four, yeah. We Almost spoke about two this years. About eight months ago, yeah. nine months ago. Look, look into this group. They're called Salt S A U L T, right? Hi. What what is this group? How can you explain this? It's it's an amazing. I haven't checked out their new album. They just dropped a new album, right? It's my favorite of all four of them. Okay, which, I got to check it out then. I got to check. Crazy it. to think about because each album, each they drop, they drop five. That's the name of the album. Five. Yeah. Then they dropped seven. Then they dropped Untitled, and then they dropped Untitled. Mm. Um, and it's Untitled, Untitled Rise, and each one was like, oh, this is album of the year, and then all of a sudden. And they don't even promo, promo all of a sudden it's like, oh wait, guess that new album. Like you wake up on a Tuesday, oh new album. Yeah. And you listen to it, fucking album of the year. Next one, album of the year. Right. There, so there's, there's no promo, there's no marketing. We don't know who's in the group. It's like on some gorilla shit, except there's not even cartoons out there, right? No. Uh, right. It's like a black. It's black. Every every cover is black and like with a number or yeah. the hands or yeah. whatever it is. Can you yeah. can you yeah. tell me something about this? Like what what is this? Yeah. All right, so they're from, from maybe I don't know. So you well, for, they're from mostly from the UK, mostly from London, right? Okay. Um. Uh. So, crooked. Remember you were talking about like oh, Cosmo, you do your deep dives of music, right? You yeah. Know, blah, 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 right. Right. So, um, I, I woke up one morning and I saw a friend of mine who barely posts. She's an old friend of mine. She barely posts, and she posted something. Hey, check out this album. It's out today, right? Mm-hmm. So I 
because I know her and because I'm friends with her and because mm -hmm. I respect her and respect her musical ear. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. also because remember I was saying like, I always want to hear new shit, right? right. Everything. I just want to soak everything. Right? I said, cool. Let me download this. Boom. It's just a download. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I listened to it and I was just like, the fuck am I listening to? Mm -hmm. It's the most next level shit in the world. And, um, and it was salt five. Right. So remember I was saying like, I, you were like, Oh, you go down the rabbit hole. So I went down the rabbit hole. Right. So I was immediately like, I need to find out everything, everything, everything about this. So um, I just, I got my fucking Columbo on or like, uh, you know, uh, you know, Perry Mason on my detective. <laughs> shit like that, you know what I'm saying? Cause I had seen in the metadata that they were songwriting credits. All right. Yeah. So then I did. A, and, and then I looked at the songwriting credits mm -hmm. and also as an aside, like when it comes to like all the tags on like, my mp3s like i got everything like i'm i'm anal like that i'm so obsessive compulsive with my taggings yeah yeah everything it's nuts right um so i looked at and i was like oh look, look at these names in the songwriting credits one of the names i know uh -huh. one of the names is somebody that i'm friends with that name is the woman who told me about this in the first place uh -huh. And, and, and oh. that's her, and that's uh, my friend Melissa. She also also known as Kid Sister. I was going to ask you if Kid Sister was involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, here's the thing: even before I seen it, I'm listening to the music, and I'm like, I know that voice. I know, it, right? You know what I mean? So I'm like, all right, cool. And then I looked at the other names, and there's two other names, right? So hit Google, right? You know, and then I realized, oh, one of the names is attached to the song that I've been playing out for like before this, I was sort of playing the song out mm -hmm. uh, for like months and months and months, which was always going fucking hard. Right. And it's the song, no fear, which was like this, like Afro beat, not Afro beats, but like Afro beat, like Fela, right. Like mm -hmm. Afro beat sounding trap shit. Yeah. Which, the song was called No Fear, and the guy who recorded that is called Inflow, I-N-F-L-O, mm -hmm. right? So then I see that the name Inflow also is the name of this guy who is also the other name of the, the songwriting credits, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other woman, Cle Cleopatra something or other, and then I realized, oh, that she is this singer, Cleo Soul, who is also signed to the label that Salt is on, who's also been produced by this guy inflow. Oh, Melissa kid sister has this record out. That's on the same label. That's also produced by. So it's these three folks, but it's really inflow. Mm -hmm. Right. And he doesn't like, he, he, he's super, I'd never met him. I've talked with the guys from the label. They're also, they're mad, like cryptic. They're mad. They make down met the guy whom I spoke to at the label when I asked him about this, this was the first day I got salt by the end of the day. And I listened to it probably a hundred times. I emailed him. I found the, 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 his email address and I just cold called him on the email tip. And I was like, I see what you did here. I, I know I figured it out. Right. <laughs> and he hit me back and he told me, right. So like, it's not like you're trying to like blow up a spot, but like the info's out there. Right. You know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's got to put two and two together. Yeah. Just got to put two and two together. Right. You know what I'm saying? And then you realize that this guy was also the guy who produced like, the, the second and third Michael Kiwanuka albums, you know what I'm saying? And like what the guy from the label told me, um, the label's forever living originals. And I actually think that the label's probably also owned at least partly, if not outright by inflow uh -huh. because I and FLO flow and forever living originals, FLO, right? Flow, flow, you know, uh, you know what I mean? So I don't know, man, that's speculation, right? Look at this but, motherfucker. Like, yo. No, no, bro. He's breaking it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. This motherfucker should work for genius, bro. <laughs> I mean, like, listen, that's what I'm saying. Like my mind, my mind goes places, bro. You know what I'm saying? But like, so here's, here's the rub. Like what I did, right? Here's the rub, right? So the guy told me, he said something. I was like, yo, what are you doing? Like, what's, what's the plan? What's the scoop, right? And he said to me, if I remember correctly, that um, they prefer that they allow the music to lead, uh -huh. right? So that's one of the things, reasons why that there's kind of this amb ambiguous nature and this the mystery behind it and whatnot. You know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? Like I said, that the info is all out there. You could find it. I found the info in one day and i put all two two together right so we don't have you know? to like bleep these names out we could leave them in the podcast or would you rather than bleep i don't know leave them in <laughs> leave them in all right. leave them in leave them in i mean no. again, it's just like you know but again to like to the you know like i don't want to again like the information's already been out there 
You know what I'm saying? So like, it's not as if though I'm breaking news, right? Or if I'm telling a secret, right? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. the metadata is telling the fucking secret, uh, discogs, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, um, but kind of on the the whole thing with them being like, they want to prefer to let the music lead first, you know? And like, you know, I I, I gather that Inflow is because Inflow does most of the music. There's a couple other sessioners I think on it as well. Mm-hmm. Um. But, you know, on the strength of just the music being that fucking good, it's my favorite band. It's my most, and, and all four of the records are my favorite records. And it's just incredible music. Yeah. And it's really timely music as well, right? And it, it's also timeless, you know? So, like, the whole thing about, like, my fervor in, like, wanting to be, like, salt, right? It's less about me being, like, it's not nothing to do with about me saying, like, that I have some sort of personal investment in the, this I don't even really know him. I know Melissa, you know, and I've spoken yeah. to a couple of the label execs, right? I've got no connection to them whatsoever. You know, the 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 world seems to think that I'm like their one man promotion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? But the whole I, thing I feel is, that I feel that way. You know what I mean? No, a lot of people said that. Yeah. And my homie actually hit me up who works for Sonos and like she works at like brand partnerships and she hit me up. She's like, Can you connect me to Salt? And I'm like <laughs> hey you know what i'm saying but but here's the, the but here's the here's the thing though like to me at the end of the day it's about like people who are putting out really really good music because they can yeah because they're doing something that uh is speaking uh uh is saying something from their heart is really doing something cool and it seems to be that it's just a little cottage industry it's just a bunch of homies that are fucking around with each other and they're just all doing it themselves yeah yeah indie stuff Mm-hmm. Right, you know what I'm saying? So like you gotta love that. You gotta love that. And 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 so like not just that, if it's the type of thing where like I'll say like, you know, this is a really, really good piece of art. Yeah. I agree. I don't I don't I don't wanna lay any sort of like claim or ownership to that. I want people to hear it. You know what I'm saying? Remember back in the day, I don't know if you remember back in the day, back in the day we used to take markers and we used to marker up the labels of our records, yeah. right? Because we didn't want to have people seeing in the record, yeah. seeing the record. Cause we wanted to be the one who had the mysterious hot record, exclusive. Right? Yeah. It is exclusive, right? You know, there'd be times when there would be like, there's a hot record in the store and there's six copies. I'm buying all six just so I can make, take them off the market and not let any other DJ have them. You yeah. Know what I'm saying? Jesus. Yeah. All right. I never did that, but okay. Oh, no, no, Cosmo, no, no. Cosmo's the one. Deadass, deadass. We used to do that. Me and Questlove used to do that shit all the motherfucking time wow. in Philly. Yeah. Deadass. Um, but uh, but it's the antithesis of that. I feel as if the music should be shared. I think that we're at a place right now that, you know, there's so much out there, mm-hmm. right? And people are, like, clamoring for anything and everything. And they're all, everybody's also feeling all so fucked up because of the world yeah. and the country and COVID and whatnot. You know what I mean? So if we have an opportunity to be like, Hey people, take a breath, settle down. Let's find it. Let's find a, a centering. Let's find a focus. Now we feel together, right? Check out this beautiful thing, mm-hmm. right? You know, to be in a position to do that to me is like an honor. Yeah. It's is, one there, of, is, it's, there, it's, is there a meaning behind they only release in June and September? I don't know. I have no idea. And I've also heard that, well, I, I think that- It's like beginning of summer, end of summer type of shit. Yeah, something like that. And I know that apparently S-A-U-L-T is like an anagram, like it stands for something. I don't really know. Mm-hmm. Um, I Because I, I know also they were given Giles Peterson um, some exclusive uh, exclusive run of like playing the album the night before. So I think that he's probably got- um, some insight into what is up with all that, you know what I'm saying? But I have no idea, no rhyme or reason as to how it is that they do. They're just kind of, they're just operating on their own wave. And it, I think that's like a beautiful thing, man. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It's just So if you're listening to this, go out and buy Salt, S-A-U-L-T, purchase it on their band camp. Uh, and then after you purchase it, listening to it on on streaming so they can double up on their revenue. Mm-hmm. Respect. It's 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 just great. It's a great uh, piece of like music, and it's yeah. one of those it's one of those albums where it, it's just better to experience it all the way through. You can't yeah. really pick songs and pick them out. It's really like yeah. a solid listen from beginning to end, yeah. uh, and it's yeah. one of the rare occasions where I've listened to complete albums without just skipping through 
and hearing the songs. Yeah, um, yeah. And so, there's yeah. not like one song that I would be like, I'm going to fast forward the song. Like no. Each song is like an incredible song. Yeah. You know and, what I'm saying? And yeah. it leads up and it, it just, yep. it helps the next song, which helps the next song. And it just kind of leads yeah. perfectly. It's great. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, there are some that I'll be like, oh, this I'll play in the club. And some I probably would not just like chilling yeah. in, in the in the crib. But like, you know, it's like I have a method of like, if there's 12 songs in an album, I, I listen to them, I rate them and like I separate like these are club bangers. Like, you know, yeah. so if there's 12, so if there's 12 songs on the Salt album. And I, I, I think the first couple, I think I marked like all 12 or all of them. Yeah. Like, okay, these are going to go on the club rate. Because club yeah. club right. it's also like club B clubish right mm-hmm. you know like you could see and it's all different too you know so it's good yeah. it's good yeah, so it's good. Def- definitely go check them out and then cosmo yo thank you so much man for for coming on appreciate the, it, on man. the show appreciate bro. Your time, yeah, man thanks yeah, a man. lot I'm thanks a- guys this was a this was a blast thank you so much yeah man uh jamie you want to take us out yeah if you want to watch this video alongside all our brand new videos that we drop every Friday, go to youtube.com slash road podcast, like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification to be the first to get the video. And and then check us uh, every Sunday, 8 p.m. Pacific time on twitch.tv slash road podcast. Uh, Cosmo, you're on Twitch as well. That's just Cosmo yes. Baker. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm, I'm on twitch.tv at Cosmo Baker. I'm all everything at Cosmo Baker. Cool. And right now I'm streaming... Uh, on Friday nights at 7 p.m., which is at uh, which at Friday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern, mm-hmm. which is my virtual disco where I play all disco in 80s and and and, and 70s and shit like that, but yeah. up tempo fancy shit, and it's mad fun. It's mad fun. And then um, Monday at 7 p.m. I do the remedy, which is nice. again like a nod to the, the party oh, that cool, uh, right? that I did um for a long time. So that's Mondays at 7 p.m. Nice. Uh, yeah. So yeah, check me out. There's other stuff I do as well. I'm actually kind of, I'm, I'm actually on, on, I'm rolling out like two other shows as well, Yeah. which I'm not sure are going to be both weekly or monthly, but Dope. yeah, but I'm on there. I'm around. Never. You, you checked out his 45 set, right? It was, it was dope. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Yeah. You did like a, a prom to 45 set. You just did like maybe three hours. Yeah. And you was like playing on break beats and, and disco and stuff. Yeah. It was pretty good, man. Oh, yeah, thank you. I just got bored. I think it was like a Wednesday, maybe, and I was just bored, and I'm looking at these 45s, and I'm like, these things are just fucking taking up space. And then I said I was alone. I was like, oh, let me just start playing it. And then I ended up playing for like two and a half hours. That was dope, yeah. Crazy, well, after this, you, after this, you got to make the emote of a babyface killer. You got to put that emote in for your for your streaming <laughs> Twitch. Babyface killer, a.k.a. young hot guy. Young hot guy <laughs> for Frankie Knuckles. That's a crazy story, Frankie. Knuckles. <laughs> that's a great Woo-hoo! fucking story. Yeah. Frankie <laughs> Knuckles trying to smash Cosmo. And that's like, <laughs> <laughs> hot, young guy delivering music. The new twelve inch vinyl. Ooh. You know what I was doing? I'm, you know, listen, I'm not the same. You know shit. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thank hey, you, Cosmo. Uh, big shout to DJ City and Beat Source, and uh, we are out, y'all. Thank you, Cosmo, again, y'all. All right, thanks, Cosmo. Peace. Thanks, Peace. guys. Much love. Peace. 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 Peace.